after a bunch of nearly two hour episodes, we should give our listeners a break. Oh no, that's will definitely be a two hour episode. <laughs> well, how about giving me a break too, Danielle? <laughs> Boy, all right. Well, buckle in, everyone. I'm just trying not to make this along. Never mind. We'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure it out. everybody and welcome to Book Retorts. I'm Danielle. I'm Sam. And this is the podcast where one of us explains a weird piece of media to the other who doesn't have any experience with it. Hey Danielle, that's you this time. That's me explaining the media, not yeah. me not knowing the media. <laughs> I mean, who knows? I might know it, we'll find out. <laughs> Before we get started, we just wanted to give a shout out to one of our favorite other podcasts. Definitely. I Drink drink Your Podcast, IDYP. Uh, We were on them just a little bit ago. It's coming out this week for the episode of We Watch the Movie Fish Tank. It's probably out now, so you know, you're behind already. Go back quick. Listen to it. (laughs) It's true. I think it came out Monday of this week. So if you're listening this week, it's already in existence. (laughs) Oh, you are so behind. You have so much to make up. It was super fun. Um, we got to hang out with the the crew over there. We highly recommend you check out both that episode and any of their others. They're always worth a listen. Yeah. And you can find them on your favorite podcatcher or Apple Podcasts or Spotify with I Drink Your Podcast or IDYP. You can also follow them on Twitter or Instagram. Yeah. So check it out. We're extra funny in that episode, unlike we are here. <laughs> <laughs> and since you're here, let's get on with the show. <laughs> yes, after Sam's epic four episode run of whatever the sh- fool on the hill. <laughs> I was about to say, you can't remember the title. After- Actually, I was thinking of Lord of the Skies or whatever the heck those st- this year. And I keep, I don't know why I confuse uh, Fool on the Hill so much with the title of the other book. They're nothing alike. Well, they're only alike in the sense that they are very long <laughs> and get progressively weirder. Yes. And so in my head, I keep saying that. And then I'm like, that's not what that's called. <laughs> but no, Fool what on the Hill. today, Danielle? Yes, we are taking a sharp turn into Danielle territory. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> this is going to be a two episode, maybe three, but probably two episode run. <laughs> Sam, give Sam a little bit of a break since he did have to I do four it. episodes in a row. So but I thought I'd do something that would fill out a couple I appreciate that, episodes. Danielle. Yep. And we're doing a book called Legend. 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 It is by Jude Devereaux. I assume that's how you pronounce her last name. I did Google it. Google did not prove me wrong. So that's how I'm going with it. But if that's not correct, <laughs> listeners, feel free to shout out. Jude, if you're out there, you can write in. <laughs> Miss Devereaux. And uh, it was in 1996, Sam, this book. Oh, it's so old, Daniela. It's her oldest piece of media yet. Uh, I guess it's ancient. Uh, I'm not going <laughs> to give not. you a summary, Sam, because oh. I, I feel this is one of those books that's just more fun if you don't know what's coming <laughs> <laughs> what about a review? Can I get a review? A review? Uh, I can give you a little bit of a history of this, how I came across this book. Sure. I'll okay. take that. So Jude Devereaux is a romance author, a pretty prolific romance author, actually. Okay. Um, okay. I know. But don't worry, this is plot heavy. So it's not, it does have a lot of romance in it, but I'm ignoring a lot of that for plot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bananas plot. I read this for the first time in high school, I think. It was quite a while ago. I don't know how I came across it. it, it don't, I don't know. Maybe it was in a bin. Maybe I found it in a bookstore. I don't know. Magically came into my hands, Sam. And I read this book. Oh, must have been Mr. Sunshine. Yes. Exactly. And I was uh, kind of taken with it at the time. And it stayed on my bookshelf. I had it for many, 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 many years and have reread it several times whenever I'm in the mood for a really odd romance. <laughs> like you are today. Like I am today. And this has been in the back of my mind. And when I was trying to think of, of single books that weren't series that I could do for this, it suddenly occurred to me that this might be a good option. You don't want to do like a six month series, Danielle? You know, I could. I've read some series lately that would make really good fodder for our podcast here that I thought I would not give you a break for that long. <laughs> well, you can always interleave them, I suppose. That's Do true. Do one episode and something else and try to remember what you did for the previous <laughs> one. <laughs> always a challenge. I will consider that for the future endeavors that we All do. Right. Well, everyone, if you want that to happen, start pestering Danielle on our Twitter to make her do that. Or Facebook or Instagram, whatever. We'll take it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
All right, let's begin the Shinda exam. Oh, let's get right in. I'm, I'm going in completely <laughs> blind this time. I know, it's it's fancy, but I really think that the, the, you'll have fun with the twists in this if you don't know they're coming. Oh, I love it when you break format. I know, thanks. <laughs> All right, <laughs> introduction. Meet Katie, the hero, the heroine of our story. She is in the midst of trying on a wedding gown for her upcoming nuptials to one. I'm already out. No, it's, it's really <laughs> short-lived. <laughs> I just listened to Fool on the Hill for four episodes. (laughs) (laughs) Fair. (laughs) For upcoming nuptials to Gregory Norman, who's apparently just the dreamiest of men, Sam. Gregory Norman, because he's a normal man. Yes, Yes, I'm sure that was her play on words. So she's having a heck of a time trying to find a wedding dress. She's short. She's petite. She's curvy. She's just not having the best of luck with those 90s wedding gowns. Oh, my gowns. gosh. <laughs> what, a horrible per- what a horrible situation to be, petite and curvy. Like, I know. How, like- <laughs> how hard is her life? <laughs> it comes up quite a few times in the story, which I'm not going to get into. But every time I read it, even as in high school, I would roll my eyes. <laughs> oh, no, you're beautiful. That's so hard. <laughs> this is like those dumb plots in movies like... You need a makeover. I'm going to take off your glasses and put your hair down. You're beautiful all of a sudden. Exactly. This is what sort of happens in this book. Of course. Anyway, so she went to, she's a chef, a professional chef, and she went to- Oh, her life is even worse. I know. She went to cooking school with uh, one of the girl, one of the women that's with her while they're trying on a wedding dresses. And everybody was shocked and horrified when she came out of school. She didn't take a job, you know, with one of the, the famous chefs that were all willing to take her on, of course, but she took a job at a rundown steakhouse called Onions. That's in Virginia. Onions in Virginia. Onions Sounds in like Virginia. a cool place to make a name for yourself. Yes. And yeah, she had the last laugh because, of course, she made this uh, like a world famous steakhouse restaurant in, in the five short years that she's been working there. So she turned it Got around. Got the Michelin star coming out the wazoo. Basically. And so all this time, she was didn't really date, didn't really do any much of that until she met Gregory, who is the son of the widow who owns Onions, the restaurant. So she's dating her boss's child. Correct, which she hadn't met until he had, she'd worked there for several years before he actually, like, she happened to meet him in passing when he was in town, and they fell okay. instantly in love. Fairy tale romance. Kind of. Sorry, I'm getting through my notes. I'm skipping over a couple of things in the beginning so that we could That's fine. get it a little bit faster. Danielle, I will never be upset about you for skipping over things. <laughs> I know, but I didn't take them out of my notes. That's why I was reading through them. Okay. So after they tried on wedding dresses, they go get some food. And as they're eating, Jane, one of the friends that's there, prompts Katie to tell them all about Gregory. And Debbie, the girl He's from- just the dreamiest. He's so tall and handsome. And he owns my restaurant, has power over me. Yes, exactly. So Debbie, the other woman with her, is super eager to hear it as well and asks asks if he's a model because he's just so attractive. And Jane, oh. and Jane's like, who cares about all that? Tell me how he looks with his face failed. And Debbie's like, what? <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> and pro- uh, Jane prompts Katie to spill everything, asking if it was love at first sight or like what happened. And she... Are just going to leave the face veiled comment We'll get off? there. She'll get there, Sam. Okay. <laughs> But no, for for the minute, it like doesn't say anything about it. It goes into a couple more paragraphs before it talks about it. So apparently she hadn't told anybody, but before she met Gregory, she'd been thinking about leaving the restaurant and opening her own. But he showed up that one day, they fell in love, and here they are. And now he's moving to the area. He's a high-powered real estate person in LA, and he's moving back to Virginia. They're going to buy a house. None of that precludes her opening her own restaurant, or even having more than one restaurant. Right, but we'll get there. Jane asks again how he looks with the face fail and debbie like jumps on it this time she's like tell me what you're talking about (laughs) thank you and after permission from katie jane kind of launches into an explanation that as a kid katie's widowed mom worked hard and a lot and so katie ended up staying with their family quite a bit and she used to have and apparently still has dreams about an arabian prince oh oh (laughs) gets worse sam stay on board you can do it Oh, this is not going to be a sensitive or nuanced portrayal of Arabic culture, is it? Mm, It doesn't really get into it much. I would say that it's not that offensive because it really just kind of sidesteps it. Okay, well, I guess that's one way to handle it. (laughs) Yeah, it just brings it up a few times and there's, uh, I don't know, I don't don't think it's that bad. Fair, all right. Uh, Only because it doesn't get into it. Maybe it would be if it got into it. So... (laughs) 
Katie tries to shrug it off like it's no big deal that she's, you know, had these dreams for the, her entire life. And but Jane won't I mean, have they're it. just dreams. People have dreams that repeat themselves. That's like not that uncommon. Yeah, she has this dream like once a week. So that's a little weird. I mean, sure. But like, I don't know. It doesn't. Uh, my first thought wouldn't be, you know what? This is definitely destiny. Right. And so she doesn't necessarily think that it is. Katie's kind of ignored okay. it her whole life. And she's like, well, Gregory kind of looks like him. Like, I, I'm sure that's what it's meant to be. You know, like, it's fine. <laughs> And apparently as a kid, Katie used to draw veils across the lower half of all men's photos she'd see in like magazines and stuff. She'd carry black markers around wherever she went. Not weird at all. <laughs> nope, I'm not. A, this is not serial killer behavior. Why do you keep bringing me romance stories with serial killers in them, Danielle? <laughs> I don't know, Sam. I'm sorry. <laughs> So Debbie asks Katie to tell her tell her more, and she goes on to say, like, not a big deal, but as a kid, I was pretty obsessed with finding this guy, but, you know, I think Gregory kind of looks like him, so, you know, maybe it's fate now. So here's the dream, because this is important, Sam. Focus on the dream. Oh, boy. Can't wait. <laughs> so I she, love when people tell me their dreams, especially when they write them down in books. I know. So that's a common trope in all of the media that we read, especially the fantasy ones. Yeah. So she's standing in a desert, and there's a man sitting on a white horse wearing a robe of black wool, and the lower half of his face is covered with a black cloth and he looks very sad sam sad Aww, sad man so on a horse sad, <laughs> he, sad horse man <laughs> he never says anything but he clearly wants something from her and it always frustrates her because she doesn't know what it is that he wants he wants the same thing all men want yes that's entirely possible given the nature of the story cheesecake <laughs> yes he's like make me cheesecake katie you're famous <laughs> you're a famous chef i'm in the desert we don't get a lot of cheesecake out here in the desert water. like come on i need water <laughs> no, cheesecake is better than water. It is. That's true. Then he holds out his hand to her and she always tries to take it, but she can never reach his hand because there's suddenly just too much distance between them because dreams. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and then he withdraws his hand and rides away. And like I said, she doesn't tell them this, but apparently she's had this dream every week since she was nine. I mean, she, I think she's a therapist. <laughs> I don't necessarily think she's, you know, has a, a magical destiny, but here, what do I know? Oh, you know what? Too bad she's a book character, Sam. <laughs> I mean, that's the only reason why I think she'd have Magical Destiny, because she's a book character. <laughs> but you'll never guess what the Magical Destiny is. <laughs> if it isn't to bring cheesecake to the great people of the Arabian Desert, then I don't want to know. <laughs> oh, well, then I guess we'll just end the episode here. Have a good day, Hi, everybody. Everyone. Thanks Take for listening. Care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do that gag a lot, and yeah, I wonder if it gets old. <laughs> we think it's funny. That's what matters. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> So they split up the group after lunch and Katie's in charge of buying a bunch of stuff for the house and she is dreading it. Like she lives for the kitchen. That is the only thing she wants to be doing and she does not understand why Gregory put her in charge of house stuff. I don't know. I think that Gregory should also participate in the filling of their home with various consumer goods because, you know, partners, but what do I know? Okay. So you, we don't see much of Gregory in the first little part of this book. He does come into play a bit later, but at this moment, this is the only thing we know about Gregory is that he's left it to her and this is the quote that is in there left the new house shopping to her because he knew quote unquote how important such things were to a woman which makes me hate him immediately yeah, no, I'm about to say <laughs> that is not a positive portrayal of this man I, here's what I imagine I imagine him as a villain from like an early 90s movie you know he's got the slick back hair or maybe like, an, like a late 90s or early 2000s movie with a slick back hair he's got the, the bluetooth earpiece uh -huh. in that he's always wearing because he's a high powered real estate guy from LA and he's got like that jerky misogyny thing that going on there and he's like the villain that the actual romantic interest will be stealing away from like like um like in the wedding singer or any of those other sort of moves from that time period where the girl is dating the jerky guy and the schlubby dude who's got a good heart steals her away from him in the end absolutely except that he otherwise the couple of times you see him in the beginning he seems very nice otherwise other than this one comment which even I mean, as a 16 year old irked me <laughs> I mean, aside from the misogyny, I'm sure he's a great guy. <laughs> aside from that, I'm sure he's fine. So she, instead of just saying to him, like, I don't want to buy stuff for this house, please hire somebody or you do it. <laughs> like, she doesn't yeah. say anything. She's just like, okay, I'll go find stuff. Like, she needs to learn how to speak up for herself. <sighs> Drives me crazy. They have bad communication relationship and they're getting married. I know. If they've only been dating like six months. I think that says uh, somewhere in this and I was shocked. Six months? I, I know. <laughs> Because she says something at some point a bit later about how it's like six months of him wooing her or whatever. I'm like, they've only known each other six months? <laughs> well, I mean, I know that many relationships have started and gotten married after a very short time. They've been wonderful and successful, and that's great. But also, many have not. Yeah, so exactly. you're really going for a gamble there, Katie. 
All right. Anyway, so she's left on her own. Her her friends go off to do some other stuff, and she's wandering a bit. And she ends up in an antique store. She's drawn in by, like, a copper mold that she sees in the window. And no one's in the shop. It's completely empty, in, including, like, the, the store clerk or owner. And she ends- Oh, Danielle, Danielle. Please let this turn into like a never-ending story situation where she goes in the store and it's like, let me get the mysterious item and it transports to a faraway fantasy land. Wait for it, Sam. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so she ends up hearing voices outside, which she follows. And behind the shop, a woman is complaining to her husband about a purchase he made, which apparently is a pickup truck loaded with ancient dirty trunks and boxes just like stacked full. Why would you buy a pickup truck full of garbage? It's not the pickup truck that he bought. It's just the garbage that he bought. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make any more sense than buy a bunch of garbage, but at least like, okay, okay that does make a little more sense. Also. They, they kind of go into it. So Katie finally interrupts because they're just going back and forth, back and forth. She interrupts and is like, hey, can I make a purchase? And the, and the storekeeper comes in mumbling under her breath and she explains that her husband just bought a whole lot of unopened trunks from an auction. And she doesn't oh. no idea what she's supposed to do with all these, you know, for her antique shop. Open them and look for a treasure. Right. And Katie basically is like, well, maybe you could, you know, have some kind of sale, you know, antique treasure sale, you know, clean them all up and stuff. So Katie's eyeing them while she's... She's an antique dealer. And she's like, I don't do with all this old, dirty furniture. I mean, like- to be fair, it's like, it sounds like a lot of boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all okay. old and decrepit. So Katie's eyeing these boxes while she's talking and she sees an old flower tin in the pile and she feels like this could she could envision this in her in her house if she spruced it up a little bit. So she asks the woman to purchase it. To be clear, this is flower the F-O- baking material. O-U-R, yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. Just making sure. I assume as much, but I you know, never want to assume too much. Yeah, nope, a flower tin, like baking flour. Yep. And uh, she purchases the box and she's surprised because she lifts it and there's actually something in it. And apparently they all have something in them. They're for you know, some kind of auction. So there is dragon stuff egg, in Dragon egg, dragon egg, dragon <laughs> egg. It doesn't go that weird, Sam. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it does, but in a completely different direction. <laughs> I thought it was maybe like a Jeremy Thatcher dragon hatcher situation. <laughs> Yes, surprise, the story has dragons. <laughs> <laughs> Why does everything have dragons in it recently? <laughs> So that night, uh, exceptionally tired, Katie makes it back to her apartment after an evening of entertaining. So you do see a little bit of Gregory in this. I'm skipping over him. He's charming, whatever. Everybody loves him. He takes her home. And he's and she does finally tell him, I don't want to buy stuff for the house. And he's like, oh, okay, hun, like, we'll hire somebody. It's fine. So, you know, oh, that nice was so moment. hard to assert yourself, <laughs> you know, like, ugh, this would communicate more people. It's yeah. good for you. Well, Katie will learn that on her adventures. As soon as he leaves, though, like she shows up at her house, as soon as he leaves, she suddenly feels her energy revive. And she's like planning out her evening. She's like, oh, I'm going to get some food, like a popcorn. I'll watch a movie. It'll be great. And then she sees the box, like in the corner of the flower tin that she purchased. And she realizes she's kind of been thinking about it all night. And she's like, nah, I'm going to open it. I want to know what's inside. I mean, that'd be the first thing I would have done. Right. Me too. But, you know. Well, if it's a dead rat, you don't want to bring that into your home. <laughs> she thought it was just dead flower. <laughs> Not dead flower, but, you know, like <laughs> old flower. Sure, rotten, moldy flower. Good. I don't want to empty that outside. I want to bring that inside to do it. I know. So she gets to work on this tin, and it's old and rusted and sealed shut. So she starts. Oh, I got it. I'm sorry to interrupt, but is Rasford inside this tin? <laughs> yes. Yes. This is actually the sequel. Here. <laughs> to Fool on the Hill. You guy like plot twist, everybody. Sam did a four episode run of Fool on the Hill, and now I am going to do a two to three episode run of more Fool on the Hill. <laughs> Fool on the Hill too. Rasford's revenge. He's back and more flower than ever or something i don't know i work on the tagline <laughs> yes rasford's inside uh it's a whole she gets transported to a world with sprites and kites i, I don't just know. say having a sealed metal tin again just, it's all i can think of at this point <laughs> so yes hold flower tin rusted shut and it's not decorated with a bow unfortunately and after scraping away the rust she manages to pull it open and inside she finds tissue paper like the really thin kind folded atop something that has a small bouquet of dried flowers resting on it and mm. she, she knows it has to be something very special because of the way it's packaged and she kind of like half considers leaving it untouched like maybe she's intruding on something but then she's like no they're long gone like i'm gonna open it up i want to know what's inside mummy's curse yes exactly so she decides to peel back the tissue and look underneath and inside is a beautiful satin wedding dress sam inside a flower tin yes how big is this flower tin it's a big flower tin sam i don't know they don't tell you the proportions but it's obviously a trunk sized flower tin how much flower does she need in her home well she didn't want the flower she just wanted the box up on her counter 
counter or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I'm no expert, but to stuff a full-size wedding gown into a tin, it's got to be a pretty big tin. In my head, it was always like a trunk-sized tin, like a, not yeah. a steamer trunk, but like a big tin. I don't know how big flower tins are. Let's Google flower tins, Sam. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, that's like, you could put like a 30-pound bag of flour. Like, who needs that in their home? <laughs> well, she wanted it. Like, Sam, you know what? This is just magic, okay? She wanted the tin, and now there's a wedding dress inside of it. I'm just saying, if I saw a flower tin that was, like, bigger than, like, I could crawl inside and take a seat, I'd be like, that's too much flour for me. I'm not running an industrial bakery. I don't know if it's that deep, but yes, it's a larger tin. Maybe it shouldn't say tin. Maybe it's, like, a flower. I don't know. That's the words they use, Sam. Wild. Absolutely wild. Okay, so she sees the wedding dress and she feels a sudden urge to close it up and put it away and never think about it again. But after a day of trying on wedding dresses and just feeling kind of awful about it, she feels like it's- Because her body is so terrible. I know, it's just so terrible. Some kind of divine intervention that this box has a wedding dress inside of it. Uh Uh-huh. So very like reverently, she takes it out and she finds like all the accoutrements included as well. This is clearly like an old dress, like 1800s old, you know, like ancient. Does she not think for a moment that is definitely cursed or haunted <laughs> no she doesn't at all <laughs> that's like my first thought <laughs> you're like eh, put this back in the box. this is like a jumanji <laughs> situation if you find something like buried and sealed in like a ritualistic way like hmm maybe i shouldn't like put that on this is why the people in poltergeist get poltergeisted ghosted whatever <laughs> because they like ignore the obvious like oh we'll put it on a, on a graveyard sure what could go wrong if we put our house there? I like the idea that this Jumanji box somebody wrapped in pretty paper and put a bouquet of flowers on top. Yeah. Well, maybe it was like, I don't know what the what the origin is yet, obviously, but they always in these sorts of things, if you want to seal away an evil thing, you have to like put some kind of ward or, yes. or other thing on top of them. So that could have been the ritualistic sealing of this thing. It would be so much better if this is an evil wedding dress. Just be, I really wish it was. <laughs> it would be such a better story. Unfortunately, it's only kind of evil. So oh. she... <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Inside, all these accoutrements are included as well. And I mean, talking like shoes and jewelry and like all, you know, the underwear and all Giant that kind of stuff. Giant I'm sorry, that flower is ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, and inside at the bottom of the box is a satin case with something heavy inside. And so she opens the case and withdraws an old photograph, which is this tin type of a man, woman, and two children, a boy and a girl. And on the back of the photo is written the word Jordan. Baby shoes. For sale. Never worn. Oh, Sam. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Wedding dress for sale, never worn. Yeah, exactly. She reaches in to take out the rest of the contents of the case and finds a man's heavy gold watch, also with Jordan inscripted on on the cover of it. Tiny to the pawn shop. Yes, and just above the hinge is a deep crease as though it's been dropped onto something hard. And the Katie's kind of looking at it and she's like, or it was shot by something, but then she's kind of like confused why she would think that because she- and then just assume she's seen too many westerns on TV. Yeah, because when I think of western, I think of shooting gold watches. <laughs> I mean, yeah, don't they usually get in the way of bullets and save you? This is a pocket watch, I assume, yeah? Yes, I assume. Out of habit, she puts her fingers over the bottom half of the man's face that's in the picture, but she kind of laughs at herself because it's a clearly, it's like a like, light-headed blonde man and it wouldn't be her Arabian prince, but... Yeah, she takes a look anyway. Why not? Yeah, it's her habit. Looking at all the things spread around her, she begins to wonder what she should do with them, but then has the idea that she should wear it to her wedding. <laughs> Did she even try the dress on? Does it yes, fit? Yes, Is it we'll like there, not so. decrepid? It's satin. No, like, it's how, like, how well does satin preserve? Apparently, it's like perfect in this box. Sam. I don't know wow. how. I mean, it was sealed shut from air and light. Sure, but like... I, I have I know nothing about fabric, so that could be true. That could be true. I don't know either. But in this story, regardless, there's obviously something magical happening. So like, let's pretend like even if this would have been dust by now, it's not in this box because it's magic. <laughs> that would only make me more wary of this fairly <laughs> evil wedding dress. Well, maybe she's like you. Maybe she's like, I don't know what fabric does after 100 years. <laughs> I mean, that's a good point. I would put it on properly. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I've, I've worn dresses from like the 50s or 40s and they were fine. So I imagine, you know, why not? Another 40 years might be okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I would love to have someone on to explain to me different fabric types because again, my ignorance stops at, can I put it in the washing machine? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say no with the wedding dress. I could be wrong. Really? <laughs> Because I read the tag and I say, oh, hand wash only? Yeah, whatever. Put in the delicate washing machine anyway. cycle. <laughs> That's what that means. That's actually what that means. Hand wash only just means delicate cycle in the washer. 
I mean, I just put it on normal instead of hot. Oh, no, I put it on delicate cycle and cold. I figure that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I'm not going to hand wash stuff. I'm sorry. I don't got time for that. <laughs> Regardless, this has no tags on it, and it does not say it can't go in the wash, so it's up to her. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would wash the dress before putting it on. I don't think I would. I probably would just put it on. <laughs> Get a dry, like, you don't know, there could be, like, lice or I don't whatever know, in living there. living a hundred years in a box, Sam? You don't know how long it's been in there or how, how they got in there. Egypt and the like, <laughs> Well, it could be covered in like lead or something. Who knows? Because <laughs> lead think... like makeups were popular. Sure, at that I don't point. think any of that would occur to me. I think I would just put it on. I totally understand why gross. she puts on the dress. <laughs> gross, absolutely gross. No, I don't even take like clothes I buy from the store and put them on without washing them first. I've definitely done that, but you're not supposed to. I, yeah. I try to wash them first. <laughs> yeah. So imagine taking a hundred year old dress from a, a mystery box and throwing that on. That's gonna be worse. Uh, maybe I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a poll on this because I got to know. Okay, yeah, we'll put a Twitter poll up. You can tell us, would you wash the wedding dress before you put it on? Yeah, absolutely. So after getting all the pieces in the right order, she realizes, like, she holds it up. It looks like it could actually fit her. So she she just feels like she should try it on. And she does. She puts it on. <laughs> Sam. I, I, I got that. Dana. I knew she was going to the moment that dress appeared. And looking at herself in the mirror, she's convinced that this is the dress she's supposed to wear to her wedding. It just feels like it fits perfectly. It's exactly what she wants. It's made for her. And But suddenly, as she's wa- watching herself in the mirror, she starts to feel very dizzy and sits down heavily on the sofa. That's the lead, I'm telling you. <laughs> it immediately soaked into her skin. She's dying, Sam. All her energy starts to drain from her and her eyes start to droop. And in the distance, she hears voices yelling about hanging a man. Okay. She's trying to stay awake, but she can't seem to keep her eyes open. And one of the men yells in the distance, Hear that, Jordan? Make peace with your maker, because these are your last moments alive. Yeah, Jordan, you do that, whoever you are. (laughs) I wasn't pausing for dramatic effect. I was scrolling down on my notes. (laughs) Either way, I got to fill it. (laughs) Spurred on by the idea that they might hurt a Jordan, which she, you know, figures is somebody from the the photo or in that family. She almost succeeds in opening her eyes, but then hears another man's voice asking her for help. And she knows that if her Arabian prince, the one from her dream, had spoken, he would sound like that person. And she immediately gives up and allows herself <sighs> to pass out. <laughs> okay, sure. This is All not right. going where you're Evil thinking it's going, Sam. <laughs> I expected the evil dress. I had not expected to be like uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, Turtles in Time, <laughs> where the magic artifact transports her back in time. Yes, the story gets progressively weirder. I almost wish we could do the second half now because it's so weird. <laughs> I do I do really want to have someone draw up like a point by point plot comparison of this book and TMNT 3 Turtles in Time. I mean, who doesn't love Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Wow. Yeah, that last one, though. <laughs> <laughs> They're all good, Sam. Shut up. All right. <laughs> so she awakens in the mountains of a desert. And the she, mountains of a desert, yeah, not the dunes. Not the dunes of a desert. She is in the mountains of a desert area. And she is okay. immediately convinced she's having some kind of vivid hallucinatory dream from working too hard. Which, you know, meh, possible. I would assume it would be like psilocybin or some other weird hallucinogen that was <laughs> on left the on dress. the dress. Yeah. Like my first thought wouldn't be, oh, I overworked. I'm hallucinating for the first time in my life after entertaining people and not having that busy a day. And more like, oh, the weird dress from the mystery box maybe had mold spores in it or something that was poisoning my brain. This is why you can't be transported to other planes of reality. Honestly, Danielle, I'm okay with that. It never ends well. So, of course, everything feels too real, but, you know, she tries to convince herself that it's just all a dream. And she takes note of her surroundings, which are definitely not Virginia. And there are petroglyphs carved into the rocks beside her, like a stick figure man, stick figure men hunting an elk. Sure. I swear to you, if this becomes Clan of the Cave Bear, I will leave it this podcast. Okay. <laughs> As she reaches out to touch them, suddenly the rock seems to open a doorway and she can see back inside to her, her apartment. Like a portal. All right. I would say go through that portal and don't look back. Well, right. Without much hesitation, she absolutely starts towards it. She's like, oh, going back to my apartment. And as she's about to go in, a gunshot rings out in, behind her. And she no. turns trying to find Run the for safety of the noise. But seeing nothing, turns back uh, to go back into her apartment. And to her surprise, she ends up seeing the Arabian man in front of her. And the way this is described in the book, I can only assume he's floating in her portal. I don't understand how he's in front of her and she's almost halfway through the portal. 
So she turns around briefly. She, it, it does that trick that movies and books do where there's a gunshot. She turns around and the second she turns back, there's the floating man in her portal. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'd be like, this is why I said don't look back. Yeah, well, I mean, you probably most people would probably look back at a gunshot. I know, but like, no, I would just be running, man. Yeah, so she's like surprised to see him there, obviously, as one would be. And she asks him what he wants. And he speaks for the very first time, Sam. And he tells Yay. her that he's waiting for her. And she's like, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm with her. Like, what? She's like, how can I find you? And he points above her head. And she realizes, she like looks back. She realizes he's pointing to a small path. And then he's asking her not to go back through the portal. So this isn't actually him. This is like a projection of him. But he seems more real than he's ever seen before, according to the well, book. Well, sure. But like, who knows in this situation what's real and what isn't? Right. So no, I, I assume it's not really him. But he's just kind of standing there blocking her way from the, into the portal. What if it'd be more fun if she had said, yeah, I'm getting married. I'm, I'm good. Bye. Well, okay. So she thinks of Gregory and her friends and onions and declines the invitation from the, the man. She steps towards good. the apartment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good for her. <laughs> but apparently, because it's a book, that's a no-go. The fates decree that she does not get a choice. So why even give her one in the first place? And the portal shuts down. <laughs> that is such BS. I know. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> Why even I'm with you. Open Why give her portal? a choice if there's not a choice? Yeah, like why fake the choice? Because yeah, there's, there's no character development without the choice. It's like psych. <laughs> All right, she's on the path to her Arabian prince, I guess. Yeah. So she is uh, really upset about this, as one would be, and yeah. she's suddenly overwhelmed by that same kind of dizziness that she had before, and she has this compulsion to follow the trail that he had pointed out. That's is she still wearing the wedding yes, dress in the she's desert? She's fully at the Sam. She wears this <laughs> dress forever. Like it's so funny how long she wears this dress. <laughs> I mean, wedding dresses are not particularly considered active wear for long hikes. No, and imagine this like 100 plus year old dress now, what, 130 years old. And it's like, it's one of those big, puffy, huge dresses that has a corset under it and like the pantaloons. And I don't know, there's like a whole thing going on. <laughs> It's like a big dress. I want to see her draping. Like this reminds me of the, the scene in Spaceballs where they're going to the desert and the princess is bringing all her luggage and she's wearing the dre- wedding dress. Absolutely, it's just like that. And she gets get. They even mention it. Like she's getting caught on stuff. It's getting dirty. Like they don't. They don't downplay the fact that she has this dress on this entire time while she's draping around great. the desert. So another gunshot rings out, and as she's stumbling down this path until she breaks free into the clearing and looks below her. So the scene below her. I'll give you give you a description, Sam, so you can imagine. Give me a it. word picture, Danielle. <laughs> Be the Bob Ross of words. Okay. On a horse, hands tied, is an unconscious man with a rope around his neck about to be hanged by four other men on horses. Got okay, it. that the whole scene, that's your word picture? No, it's, I'm not done. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's the scene. However, going on sheer instinct and that she didn't like the look on the other guys' faces, she assumes they're the bad guys. So she Bad en- <laughs> idea. <laughs> so she ends up creeping up on the guy who's like farthest away from the others. Um, and he has a shotgun uh, aimed or rifle aimed at the guy who's on the horse and knocks him unconscious with a rock. She like jumps on top of him and knocks him out. She's being very cavalier here. Like you just stumbled on a scene. You have no idea the context is even if they are the bad guys like she's a one person in a wedding dress who's unarmed yes absolutely but that's the plot of the story sam (laughs) okay being our hero she will probably make it out alive i hope she doesn't (laughs) so she has no idea how guns work but accidentally manages to shoot off a round towards the other men which startles them because they think obviously that they're under fire from somebody and she hides in this tiny space between the rocks as the men search for the shooter and eventually they get concerned i think she shoots them like once more like she manages to figure out how the gun works and eventually shoots towards them once more so they like genuinely think there's somebody aiming at them and eventually they agree that they're gonna scatter and leave him but they want to shoot the horse out from under him so that he'll you know die die. also just to be clear she's hiding from these men in a giant wedding dress in the dead like this isn't camouflage yeah if i recall correctly like she shoots the gun and the kickback on it like pushes her kind of into a crevice and she just kind of like pulls everything in and like she's small enough (laughs) i know i when i was reading it because i had never read it with that critical of an eye to be honest i mean why would i and i was reading it i was like how does her dress stay in that little tiny crevice that she's you stuck know, in <laughs> absolute nonsense if these men were searching for her they would find her immediately yes that's true okay so apparently these guys aren't good shots though or don't even stick around to see if they actually hit the horse because it graze almost grazes the horse but the horse is fine and just kind of stood there it's a well-trained horse <laughs> 
horses are very placid creatures. We know this. <laughs> well, it's stretched like as far as the guy's neck is going to go, but the horse is trying its best to stay there. And with much effort, she manages to climb up on this horse and pull the guy free from his noose. <laughs> And she unceremoniously gets him off the horse and onto the ground. And he's super cute, Sam. Oh, how shocked am I? <laughs> the story is going nowhere where you think it's going. This is the best part. I know, but like, I still don't like any of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to. No, I mean, it, it's actually very interesting in the story <laughs> here. Although I think the character so far, uh, or at least the character that we know, makes no sense. <laughs> to be fair, I am skipping over a lot of... There's not a ton of character development up to this point, but... We do get a bunch more in the next upcoming chapters, and I will not be sure. going in depth of all of her character traits uh, because I don't have time for that. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. This feels like a book that is very much internal monologue from Katie, like you're inside her head. Mm, no. No? no. Okay. I mean, you do get a, a bit of that. You do actually get a chapter or two in this other guy's head as well. It kind of jumps jumps around a little bit and it's more like third person omniscient maybe okay well you know what there's that's what i get for making assumptions yeah you i mean you get a, you get a bit about what she's thinking but i wouldn't say you don't feel necessarily in her head or in his head or whatever all right well continue on then let's see what the cute unconscious man wants <laughs> She sets up camp for the night while she's waiting for him to become conscious and checks out the, the photo again. She's like sitting around waiting and she, cause she assumes it probably has something to do with why she's here maybe. And How she, does she set up camp? Is there like supplies around here? Well, he's got his horse and stuff. So she's got a few things uh, around there and she just starts a, I think she starts a fire and then, you know, gathers some greens or whatever, something to eat while she's waiting. She's not like it's an actual camp. <laughs> she's very resourceful. She I would have starved. <laughs> <laughs> she's a chef, Sam. <laughs> Yeah, but, like, being a chef is one thing. Be able to forage in the wilderness is a whole other thing. She's very, like, into that kind of thing. She loves oh, okay. doing recipes. Food is a major part of this, and I think that's one of the reasons I've I've held on to this book for so long is because there's, like, a lot of things I like about all the food aspects of it. So it's kind of it's kind of food porny. Uh, there's definitely parts of it that are, and like the plots okay. bananas, and that's fun to read too because there's time travel and that's just weird. But like, yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> like part of it is that she does a lot of food stuff, and I got a kick out of all the food talk. So she pulls out the photograph that uh, she had brought with her in the little pouch thing that she has, and she realizes that the boy that's in the photo is the man that she's with now. They're clearly either the same person or very related. And she's like, well, that's impossible because that was 100 years ago because apparently coming oh, through yeah, a rock yeah. is like... <laughs> she can't put two and two together here. <laughs> so this is a quote, which I thought was funny. If he were the boy in the photo, then that would mean that when she went through the rock, she'd done a bit of time manipulation, which of course was impossible <laughs> because coming yeah. through the rock is normal. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else has been totally normal up to this point and totally plausible. So she ends up searching through his belongings and she finds coins from the 1870s and a letter from 1873 stating that Cole Jordan owed $20 for cattle. And she's kind of not having it. And she sticks everything back into its pockets and pretends like it's not there. <laughs> I mean, that is a reasonable response to that situation. I guess so. So the next morning, she wakes up and Mr. Cole Jordan, assumedly, is trying to make out with her. And at Wait, <laughs> what? Trust me, Sam. <laughs> at first, she's into it because she's like half asleep and she kind of just thinks it's like Gregory or something, you know? She's not really like fully awake. That's not okay. Right. And then she realizes she's in a book plot and wakes up and is like, oh, no, 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 no. Get away, get away, get away. And he apologizes and tells her, basically, like, I thought you were my guardian angel or something, like, that you were gifted to me to save me in this situation. That's why I started And that means I can just do whatever I want with you. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's kind of a bit of a, like, 1800s dude. <laughs> Yikes. So from one kind of modern misogynist to a pre-modern misogynist. <laughs> Slightly, yeah. He, he gives her, he definitely is a better version than maybe Gregory, though we don't know that much about Gregory yet, but we'll get there. Mm-hmm. And he insists on taking her home. I bet he does. Yeah, so he insists on taking her home because she's like, I like I've gotta go. You're okay, you're alive, like I'm gonna head out. Thanks. And, you know where are you gonna go, lady? Yeah, well he's like, there's no houses around here. Where are you going? <laughs> and she suddenly has the stupid realization that he could have been about to be hanged because he's you know evil <laughs> like, oh yeah okay what a, what a novel concept <laughs> but she's like well I, you know he's he i think he's a nice guy my gut instinct tells me he's probably okay 
This is as nonsensical as ever. There's nowhere to go and pull on the hill. <laughs> yes, exactly. So he doesn't want to leave her in the middle of the mountains and like, you know, his whatever 1800 sense of of taking care of a woman. He feels Chivalry. like, I can't, yeah, like I can't just leave you here. That's nonsense. You just saved my life. Like, that's not how you do things. And she finally is kind of, she doesn't give in, but she's like, okay, well, why don't you go get some food and I'll cook it and, you know, we can start there. And then maybe you can take me back to those petroglyphs, wherever those are, and I can get home. <laughs> Makes much sense to say anything else, I suppose. Right. And so she tells him, because she had patted him down earlier because she was trying to you know, find stuff. So she knows that he doesn't have like any knives or anything on him as far as she knows. And so she's like, if you want to go get some food, like hunt some food, there's a rifle over there by the trees to use on the hunt. And to her surprise, he pales, picks up the gun, and shatters it against some rocks. That sounds like a waste. <laughs> well, yeah, she's shocked. She's like, what if those men come back? Like, what are you going to do? Why would you destroy our yeah. only weapon? And he just says, I don't like guns. She's like, oh, uh, duh. <laughs> I figured that out. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And she asks him if he's a good guy or a bad guy, because that'll sniff out the bad guys. I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this is just like Dorothy. Like, are you a good witch or a bad witch? Huh. And I'm like, yeah, like, I'm going to answer like, oh, yeah, I'm a bad witch. Destroy me. <laughs> yep. And he's like, well, I'm, go I'm good, obviously. That's what he would say even yeah. if he wasn't. And the people who were after him were just jealous because he has a little bit of land and cattle. And he and so also, that's murder worthy. Yes. And he also drops during the conversation that they're in the Colorado Rockies. So that's where they are located currently. No longer in Virginia. I, I mean, I, I figure that Colorado is not in Virginia. <laughs> I know. I was just... But in case you couldn't remember where they started, Sam, I was trying to be helpful. Okay, I didn't remember where they started, but I don't know if it's important. <laughs> well, it's not really that important, but sort of. The setting is a big piece of the story, so I guess it's sort of important that they're in the Colorado Rockies. Yeah, okay. So before they can get too into it, he asks her about the whole wedding dress situation, validly, which yeah. she can't explain for also obvious reasons, though she kind of tries and he's just like, uh-huh. And the only takeaway from, from Cole seems to be that he's jealous of this Gregory dude because he's pretty into her. <laughs> well, I realize that from the sexual assault he inflicted on her just moments ago. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, she asks him if there's like an airport or a bus stop nearby that she could get to. And he's like, what are you talking about? Because she has not accepted that she's 100 years in the past yet. <laughs> Uh, but she has to say that she's in Colorado. <laughs> she's like, yeah, well, apparently I'm in a different place, but I'm definitely not 100 years in the past, even though everything suggests that I am. Clearly. And before he can even go hunt, she decides, no, I'm going to go head back to towards the portal. And he doesn't seem to stop her. And she is trying to figure out, she's doing that conversation with herself of like, why am I here? Like, I saved this guy from getting hanged. Is there, like, do I have to do more? Like, shouldn't I be sent back to my world by now? Like, am I here for a reason? Which would be the most annoying part about traveling, I think, to another time or dimension or whatever, is wondering if you have some kind of purpose. Can this just be like a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court where it just sort of like, yeah, it happened. <laughs> uh, good luck now. It could be, but we'll find out. No, she definitely has a purpose. I get it. Uh, sort of. Maybe. I mean, it's, it's arguable. We'll get there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> So, unable to find the petroglyphs again on her own, she's, like, wandering the hillside. She can't find them. She sits down because she's awfully tired, understandably. And she tries to, like, wish herself back. Like, if I just close my eyes, when I open my eyes again, I will definitely be back in my time. And she awakens to being back by the fire. Cole's cooking some rabbit. <laughs> so, he apparently picked her up and carried her off while she was asleep. Man, this is all sorts of creepy. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> So he pulls out the satin box. She apparently had left it behind when she stormed off to go find the petroglyphs and asks if she wants to explain why she has a picture of his family and his dad's watch in her possession. And she's like, nah, you know, I don't, don't really need to explain it. I don't think you're going to believe me anyway. Probably true. And then she kind of changes the subject a little bit and just asks if he's the boy in the photo, which she confirms that he is, like the grown-up version. And she asks him about his sister that's in the photo, and he tells her that her his sister died when she was seven, along with his mom. Um, there was, I know, it's a sad story. So there was a bank robbery in Legend, which is the town nearby. Paddle of the book, Sam. Woo -woo. <laughs> I forgot that already. I know, that's why I told you. Thank you. Uh -huh. And as all the thieves rode out um, after the robbery, the good citizens of Legend open fired, and his sister and best friend were killed in the open fire from, you know, friendly fire. And his father and grandfather went after the robbers and were murdered days later. And then his mom died the next year from grief. 
Hence why he hates guns. What an effective way for the citizens to stop those bank robbers, shooting wildly and killing their own. Yes. They managed to do that, and that's why he hates guns to this day. I mean, sure, but also, like, maybe blame the idiots behind the guns also. I mean, both are bad. Uh, That kind of comes into play. He's also not a big fan of all the people who shot people. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Fine. So she doesn't really know what to say to that. Obviously, she feels bad for him, but she changes the topics to the petroglyphs, and he insists that he doesn't know where they are, that the mountain has a zillion in there, and he doesn't know which one she's talking about. And she tries to tell him that she's from the future, which he obviously doesn't overly believe. But she's like, but you just think I'm crazy. Like this, obviously, this story is bananas. And he's like, no, you know, I actually don't think you're crazy. I was just thinking that you kind of need someone to take care of you regardless of whatever year you were born in. So Uh (laughs) because, you know, you're in a world where men take care of women. So I think you should marry me. And she immediately is like, absolutely not. I am not marrying you. (laughs) Marry this person you just met. And she basically manages to insult him instantly by insinuating that he's only after sex. And he's like, uh, I'm not. That's not what I was suggesting. But I, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I know. I mean, all his acts up until this point indicate differently. <laughs> right. And he becomes like very businesslike and is like, that's fine. Like, we can just be neutral people that are in each other's lives. And I will take you down to the mountain and you can find employment and a place to live and come back and search for the petroglyphs, you know, on your free time. That's totally fine. That he's being a little butthurt about it, which I don't think it's fair because, as you said, like, he's kind of been a jerk up till this point. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. And the only reason he's expressed any interest in her up to this point is a sexual interest. Yes. So I think it's fair for her to think that he just wants to marry her and have sex. <laughs> So she agrees to go into town and tries to clear the air, explaining that she didn't want to, she doesn't want to just marry him to get a roof over her head. And in her time, she's engaged to this guy that she loves named Gregory. And whether he believes it or not, she's a, like a chef and she's really good at her job. And she can definitely find a job in any time period because she's so good at cooking. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Not not to contradict her, but cooking techniques and tools have changed dramatically over the years. Like the way you make things and what you make and the tools you have to use to make them are vastly different. Yeah, which this book actually kind of gets into, which is one of the reasons I really liked it. (laughs) Okay, good. I think you'll find that she is way overconfident. Yeah, no, she's super overconfident. And there's more of a conversation happening here. I'm kind of summarizing, but he basically is like, you're in a different world. This is not a place that's like easy for women to get jobs, you know, like. Like yeah, that's true. You're, you're gonna you're gonna struggle, and I'm like I. That's the reason I offered marriage. Essentially, I wasn't trying to like tie you into anything. I'm just saying that like I can put a roof over your head. And she's like, I don't want that. I'm you know in my time I'm independent, and I want to try to be independent here. And he's like, okay, well let's take you down the mountain, and you go for it, lady. <laughs> <laughs> And so she's like, I just want to be friends. And he's like, sure, let's do that. And he mostly chills, but he does do the annoying uh, passive aggressive thing. Like, well, since you're so independent, feel free to get on this horse by yourself instead of like helping her up when she's in this giant wedding dress because he's being a jerk about it. Yeah. So love that. (laughs) So far, all the male characters in this book are just so likable. They are a little aggressive. I didn't say I like the male characters in this book. I just like this book. (laughs) Totally fair. (laughs) So they finally reach the town, and to her surprise, like, she was expecting kind of like an old-style movie set western, you know, gunslinging yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of thing. And to her surprise, it's something, like, out of a movie set. It's clean and tidy. There's only one saloon. There's a big ice cream parlor, beautiful church and library, a mosque. Ooh, ice cream? Yes, ice cream. There's a mosque. Yay. There's no guns anywhere in the town. It's just like... You there's a mosque? Yeah, there's a mosque. We'll get into it, Sam. Yeah, cool. <laughs> And he, I know, yeah, just it's it's very (laughs) unusual in a, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's just I'm glad this book is trying to be less cliche in its presentation of the time. It's not like a uh, western spaghetti western or something. It is, yeah. It's kind of it's interesting. It's an interesting take, I would say. I it it does some interesting stuff. That's one of the reasons I've always liked this book, even though it's super freaking weird. (laughs) So. He offers to drop her off at the hotel with the expectation that they might need a cook, right? And he agrees to let her go with the promise only, with the promise that the next day at two, she's going to meet him in front of the church and let him know that everything's all right because he feels duty bound to her essentially because she saved his life. So she wants to make, he wants to make sure that she's got a job and is good to go. What's your number, dude? Just give her your cell phone number. I'm sure that'll work. (laughs) I'm sure that works this day. Send me a text when you're ready. So she agrees and watches him go kind of nervously because he's the only person she knows in this time period. And 
He stops at a group of kids playing marbles and hands them some money from his pocket, and they all run off to the ice cream shop, and she kind of, you know, smiles at that, like, oh, what a you sweet see guy. He's dreamy and kind to children. Mm-hmm. And she wonders, as she's, like, as he's departing, she wonders if she should have asked him to buy her a new dress before she goes on her spree to see if she could find a job. And the answer to that is yes. That would have been the time to, like, ply that connection. <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> also... <laughs> There is a, there is a vast difference between marriage and just not interact with the person. Like she could have said, "Hey, I don't want to marry you, but I would appreciate a friend I could stay with for a few days." Okay, so this kind of comes up a little bit later, but given the time period and where he lives, which she, he gets into, it's like a little bit harder for her to just randomly okay. stay with the dude, right? All right, which all right, sense. fair enough. But yeah, he could have given her a couple of coins and said, "You know, go buy yourself a dress and then go find a job." <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Assuming like, he had it. You don't take you don't take visa here in the 1870s yeah and i don't know you know who knows how much money he has at this point so like Mm. maybe he doesn't have any extra money to give her but she goes into the hotel to speak with the manager cut to the next day it is now an hour before she meets cole and apparently she has tried everywhere in town including the mines outside of it well one of the mines outside of it and nobody will hire her or give her any food and now she's starving and jobless so far so good yes and as she nears (laughs) the church at the appointed hour she can hear people inside singing and cole shows up as she's waiting and apparently he's a choir boy and is supposed to be helping out in the church in a bit and he's kind of distracted because he feels like he needs to get into the church. Danielle, I gotta say they are trying so hard to make Cole into the best person ever. Yeah, it's that's part of the fun of this book so we'll get... Okay, <laughs> we'll get okay good. I, I can't wait for the heel turn. <laughs> and after she tells him her sob story, he surprisingly just brushes her off. He's like, well, you know, it sounds like you're trying your best. Here's a couple other places you can try. Like, good luck out there. I'm glad you're okay. What about like a reference or introduction or something <laughs> yeah well he doesn't offer any of that he just like she's just and she's like shocked she's like you what you were yesterday you were like declaring marriage to me and today you're like well good luck <laughs> It is pretty uh, unbelievable. And he's like, I gotta go in to practice. They're waiting for me in the church. And she's just shocked that he's being so callous. And she immediately like breaks down crying. And she finally admits that she needs help. And he's perplexed. He's like, I can't do a whole lot. Like, I can't force someone to give you a job. I don't own the town. And she said, she had said earlier that she like didn't want his help or protection or anything, right? And even if he put it, he feels like even if he put in a good word, that later she would probably hate him for it. Okay. I know. (laughs) And he offers to take her to Denver to look for a job there, but she insists she has to stay in this town because she has to look for the petroglyphs, which makes sense, I guess. I guess. I don't know. Like, she had the magic dress that transported her. Why does it have to be there? Like, she wasn't in Denver near the petroglyphs when she got into the portal in the first place. I mean, I would just assume I have to stay in the same area if that's the only place the portals opened up. I'd at least try to stay there for a while. Okay. So she offers to cook for him, which is something he had kind of offered on the fly earlier. It was like, well, you could come cook for me. No, you want to be independent and like do your own thing. Like a private chef scenario? Yeah, like on his property, you know, kind of thing. And he he goes on about how she's, no, you're self-supporting independent woman. I wouldn't want you to do that. And she basically like tells him to cut it out. Like, am I supposed to grovel? Like, what do you want from me, sir? He's being a real <laughs> jerk. <laughs> he is. And he then explains to her, kind of like I said earlier, that he can't actually hire her because he can take her for a meal, but he lives like way out in the country and it wouldn't be right to have a woman on his property with just a bunch of men that are out there. Um, so the whole town would kind of talk about it and it wouldn't be good for her or for, for them. And realizing she's out of options, she does ask him if his marriage proposal is still on the table. Yep. And he admits, <laughs> this is, he makes this so difficult. He admits he offered marriage in the heat of the moment, but now he's afraid of what people might say. And she is like off on a tirade, like the people in this town that you're worried about would let a woman starve. So what does it matter what they think when you yeah. want your marriage? Are you going back on your word? You just said yesterday you would marry me. <laughs> like, you why? tell them. <laughs> They could have a sham and, marriage too. They could be like they could pretend to be married or whatever. Right, and she like this is basically what they're kind of doing. And she storms off, and then she trips, of course, and he catches her. And because she's got to be clumsy, right? And she t- that's just the law of the nineties. And she tells him to put her down before one of her his fancy town folks see him. And he's and he's sullied, and she's sullied. But apparently, it's too late because the entire choir at the church has now come out and sees them standing like together, wrapped around each other's arms, essentially. And he's uh, like, "Well, gee, now." I have to marry you. <laughs> this is the worst part, Sam, I promise. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, I got it out of my system. <laughs> This is what I have to put up with you. You can certainly go with a few random marriages. I mean, it's fine. I just, I just had to get it out there. I just had to get it out there. <laughs> 
So they have a small chat about the logistics, which is basically like she doesn't have to do anything she does not want to do. It's just a marriage in name, essentially. Perfect. And he's like, uh-huh, yep, let's do it. <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly like, – he's like, I'll get into those pants eventually. <laughs> I'm probably – I'm pretty sure that's the basis of this marriage. Eesh, not a healthy marriage. <laughs> well, and he's like, I'd be honored to marry you. I will not touch you without your permission. And she agrees and then is like, I'm going to go home the minute I can. Just, you know, do not get attached to me, essentially. <laughs> So the next morning, she wakes up in a house in the country. Wait, wait, and wait. She, I want, I they're want to married. Say they're married. I get that. Is she going to be like her own grandmother? Is this going to be like one of those situations? No, that would be hilarious, but no. <laughs> All right, great. There is some weird time travel nonsense, but that is not one of them. All right, well, okay. So the next morning, she wakes up. Cole's not there, so she gets to work making some food, of course, because that's what she does. So it's kind of fun because she's going around the house and like picking up for like, how can I make this bread? How can I do this? Like, I don't have what ingredients I don't have. And so she's trying to like figure it out, which is kind of fun. Part of this book is her puzzling how to make stuff that she wants to make without the normal ingredients or yeah. things to cook on. And so when Cole still has not returned, like hours later, she sets up all the food as a picnic and goes in search of him. But apparently he's actually pretty close nearby and he's at a street fishing and he is fishing shirtless and this is for plot not because he's just randomly shirtless <laughs> uh, i think it's for plot and also for like ooh, look at that rippling back <laughs> yes he is very attractive and she watches him for a while but she realizes that along his back um and torso he has at least like half a dozen bullet scars and he explains you know when they get together to eat their food that he was also shot when his family was killed but he survived and they didn't i'm starting to doubt that his whole family was killed in random crossfire you'll find out it just seems it just seems rather convenient that they were the only one to injure it in the random crossfire yeah well i can't tell you sam because that would just, ruin the plot of the story. <laughs> no, I'm just expressing my, my my dubiousness. Continue. So he has a bunch of fish he's caught, and she's delighted by the challenge of cooking without normal ingredients on a, and on a fire, et cetera, et cetera. And she keeps, like, making all these long-term plans in her head, and then is like, wait, I'm not going to be here long-term. Like, I can't, you know, smoke fish. I can't make olive oil. Like, I don't have time for this stuff. <laughs> I mean, you could. What are you going to do? Well, she wants, she's hopeful that she's going to go back, like, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, but smoking a fish isn't like, oh, I got to spend all day smoking these fish. Fish. I can't go look for petroglyphs while they're smoking or whatever. <laughs> so anyway, she asks him if she can, if he'll take her to the petroglyphs, and he clearly doesn't want her to go, and tells her as much, asking for three days with her. Just three days, Katie. No, <laughs> no. I feel like it's important to note that Katie's name is spelled K-A-D-Y because because. <laughs> okay, that is very important to know because obviously I did not expect that. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like what would be in a romance book. <laughs> K-A-D-Y? Are you sure it's not Caddy? Uh, it could be Caddy. I just said Katie. I don't like, think they like, ever says like a in the did? story. Is she like a bug? Is that what Katie did? <laughs> I've always heard Caddy did. I've always heard Katie did. Well, you know what? You just why you said Katie and I said Caddy. <laughs> well, there we go. Well, Katie did. Let's call the whole thing off. But um, bum She's like... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, basically, like, I can't stay here three days. They might be looking for me. There could be, like, an old entire police investigation by now. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, you don't know that. There could be absolutely no time passing at all in your world. And it strikes her as weird that he basically hasn't asked anything about the time travel. He kind of just is like, sure, that happened to you. Why not? I mean, to be fair, I've always thought that weird about time travel. Like, you can return to the exact point you left. It doesn't necessarily mean that time is passing. Like, it's as, it's as plausible as anything else. Right. And so she's like worried that time is passing. He's like, you don't know that. And he does seem convinced, like he does, he doesn't seem to necessarily believe maybe that she's traveled through time, but he does seem to believe that she'll disappear if she finds the rocks for like whatever reason. She's, he's convinced of that. And he's like, I'm so attracted to you. I can't let you go. Yes. So she refuses his three day request and Cole relents saying, okay, I'll take you back tomorrow morning. And as he's talking to her, he goes to pull a leaf from her hair and she jumps away. She's still like super nervous around him, which, you know, Understandably, she just met him 24 hours prior. <laughs> and her first interaction with him was him... Him making out with her. Against her will. <laughs> <laughs> he did stop, to be fair, as soon as she told him to. Yeah, but like, his assumption that, oh, I can just take what I want is pretty revealing. He did kind of think she was literally an angel. Yeah, I'm not saying I, that well, it's right. Yeah, it's yeah. not. <laughs> do, if you came across an angel, like, the first thing you do with that angel is I really want to go, I really want to go, <laughs> I want right, to go make I out agree. with that angel. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Sleep <laughs> angels, let me take that. Like, maybe I'd have some reverence for an angel if I thought they were actually an angel or something. Yeah, he just started making out with her. thought it was kind of like half dream. Anyway, it's... It's less creepy in the book, but it's still a little creepy. <laughs> okay. 
So he's a bit put out by how like jumpy she is around him. She's like, he's like, I don't know what specifically I've done other than making out with you that one time that makes me makes you feel like you can't trust me. What and- has he done to earn her trust? <laughs> <laughs> Not nothing. Well, he married her, hasn't touched her yet, other than that one time making out with her, so I guess there's that. Right. And she tells him that the only way she'd trust him is if he was a eunuch. And to her surprise, after beat, his eyes widen and he turns super pale and he's like, who told you? And she's like, what? <laughs> is he actually a eunuch? Is that why he's in the choir? We'll get there, Sam. <laughs> is he a castrati? No. <laughs> and she's super confused. Castrato? And- Sorry. <laughs> and he explains he's like that's why i'm 33 and i'm not married is that the the bullets hit the lower half of my body too and i can't make babies and it's not like so none of the women in town want him so he's basically like a data fully functional but unable to reproduce exactly and it's like in this day and age like what kind of woman wants to marry some guy who can't give her babies right in the 1800s uh-huh. and so that's why he's asking her for the three days because he just kind of wanted to like experience actually you know having a wife essentially (laughs) this whole situation is so uncomfortable (laughs) (laughs) it gets weirder sam uh and he's like but it really hurt gregory to miss you for three days like it's not that big a deal like what's the worst that's gonna happen if you go home in three days versus today (laughs) maybe the portal will be completely gone in three days like she doesn't know she doesn't know but she eyes him she's kind of like contemplating the story wondering if this this is what would drive me crazy she's wondering if this is why she was sent back to like give her Give this guy a chance, you know? And so her nope. her her first thought here is maybe my purpose is to come back in time to serve this man. <laughs> yeah. Just like give I him three days. <laughs> hate that. <laughs> hate that. I know, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's so regressive. That's so bad. <laughs> the story cracks me up. This is the weirdest story. <laughs> boy and she's like it doesn't even matter because if like i get if i come back nobody's gonna believe my time traveling cowboy story anyway so like i guess i could say three days live it up and then she wonders if maybe this might make it slightly better sam she does wonder if maybe she's meant to learn something from these three days like it's not just about him it's also like maybe i'm supposed to learn something about this situation in the next three days yeah learn about your arabian prince <laughs> And so she agrees. That's the point of the story. And he's super happy about it. I mean, they could still be looking. I don't I, Nonsense. Let's go. I just move <laughs> on. So the book switches to Cole's perspective for a chapter. And we get a, basically like a summary of his side of things up until now, which is basically that he was super into Katie. He thinks Duh. she's an angel sent from heaven. He kind of half believes that she's from the future, but he's just basically willing to go with it because he likes her so much. And he definitely tricked her into marrying him somehow. It's not clear in the story yet how that happened, but he was it's the, he's behind it. <laughs> so he, he knows that like the whole, oh, let me, you fall and I catch you is something like duplicitous about that. We'll get there. Okay. And he he knows where the petroglyphs are. He's pretending like he didn't, but he does. And he's getting worse and worse. I know he gets ter- It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> and he thinks he's convinced that Katie's not really in love with Gregory because when she talks about him, it sounds like he's, she's talking about a business partner and not somebody that she loves. And he he knows that could just be his like how he's envisioning it. But that's how he feels every time that she talks. Is like that she's. She's not really in love with him. And yeah, he's also, so good at understanding relationships from 100 years in the future. And he's also definitely lying about the eunuch thing. He grabbed onto it when she said it. I kind of hate him. <laughs> it's understandable. He's not super likable. He's actually likable in the story because he's kind of a dork. But like the things he does, you're like, no. <laughs> he reminds me of like those self-proclaimed nice guys. Like, oh, I'm such a nice mm-hmm. guy, you know. But like, really, he's only interested in himself. Right? Yeah, and he does have a bit of a character arc during the story of like being less about himself, which is good. Okay, well, I, I still don't like him. I would not. No, that's no. totally fair. I think he's such a jerk in the beginning of the story. So the next morning in bed, um, I haven't slept together, don't worry, Cole randomly asks if she's ever rode a spotted pony. And at first she insists that she didn't, like they didn't have the money or the time for that when she was growing up. And then she suddenly remembers that she actually did once at Did a he have party. a dream about a girl riding a spotted pony? He did. Uh-huh. With wearing a red dress. And she's yeah. astounded. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah, that was totally me. And he tells her that he used to have this dream up until he was nine. And then they, the dream disappeared. He never had it again after the bank robbery. And she's a little weirded out by that. But she almost tells him about her own dream, but doesn't end up telling him. So 
they decide to go camping that night. Like, that's how he wants to spend two of his days, I guess, is to go camping. Because they're not living a, a pastoral enough life as it is. <laughs> I know. I always thought this was weird. Like, why would you want to go camping? You live in the woods. <laughs> yeah, you live on a, a ranch away from everyone. Like, you're like, oh, we got to get out of the city life and go camping. <laughs> crazy so they go camping and on the way they discuss that they discuss more about the town but one of the things the important things is that they discuss the history of the mosque and i guess a few years after his friend Tarek's death at the robbery his best friend his uh, father Tarek's father struck it rich with a silver mine and used the money to build the mosque in honor of his son that's why there's a mosque in town and okay sure just for the plot points. And they also have some quality bonding time where they almost kiss, make out, sort of. But then she remembers Gregory. <laughs> She's really torn. <laughs> I don't know why. She's with this guy for all of, like, one day. I know, but she... So he kind of is like, what can I do? Cole says to her, basically, like, what can I do to win your love? Like, I want you to, like, he puts it on the table. Like, I'm really into you. I want you to love me back. But, like, what's the best way to go about it? I That's guess? not how it works. <laughs> like, which I think is pretty funny. And she admits, basically, like, I really like you. And, you know, you listen. I. It's really sad in the story. She basically is like, you listen to me more than anybody else has. And you, like seem to really truly care about me because the, the way he, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff but like you've paid more attention to me than most people have in my entire life and you know obviously that feels good and it's like more so than Gregory but I'm in love with Gregory and I'm thinking don't don't be in love with Gregory then like <laughs> if he doesn't feel like you're being paid attention to then maybe don't marry Gregory also there's more than a binary choice here it doesn't have to be Gregory or Cole it could be neither it could be, and maybe we'll get into that, Sam. Maybe it'll be neither person, Sam. Uh-huh. I, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so he asks her more about her life and working for the restaurant, um, and apparently it's a pain in the butt working for Mrs. Gregory, the woman who owns the restaurant, because she's kind of old and terrible and set in her ways, and even though Katie's the literal heart and soul of this entire restaurant, the woman won't pay for any appliances to be updated, and it's like pulling teeth to get any you know, ingredients or stuff that she wants. And Cole gets into a whole conversation with her about, like, who owns the restaurant? Are you getting any of the proceeds? You know, it's doing so well and it's doing well because of you. Do you own part of it? Did you get any shares or whatever? Yeah. Right. And uh, whether Gregory asked her to marry him after her contract was up or before the contract was up, which apparently was after. And he's basically su highly suggesting or flat out saying that Gregory wants to marry her so she doesn't leave onions, which had been her original plan. And I mean, that, that seems like a really dumb reason to marry someone. And also, she could leave onions even if she did marry Gregory. Like nothing, like I said, nothing stops her like from having another restaurant. Chefs often have multiple restaurants. This is a non-issue. It is, except that I think for Katie, and given her character in this book, which we haven't gotten super into, but I think the more you get to know her in this book, she's very devoted in a way where like she would not open another restaurant if she was married to the son of the owner. Like she would, it would, she would devote her life to this restaurant. That's dumb. Like it is. I'm not like, saying train it a isn't. replacement, keep that restaurant going, still work there, but open another restaurant too. Like that's just good business. <laughs> yes, but that's I, and I think it's hard to get into without spoiling parts of the story. But like this part of her arc is kind of learning her self worth in the story. Okay, so All right. right now she very much I think would very much stay with this restaurant and wouldn't do a whole lot else if they didn't want her to. And so this is something that also one of her friends said to her, um, who was an accountant, was basically like, if you divorce and you know leave the restaurant you get none of the pros like you're gonna have nothing you're just gonna have what you brought into it and they don't even pay you very much like you're not, you're not getting a lot of money for the job that you're doing considering you're the entire reason the restaurant's doing well that's a fair point and she's like well well i'll be married i'll own half of everything she's not not legally you're not signing it like that's <laughs> not like put that in your your contract then you know right your prenup or whatever yeah so um this kind of freaks Katie out and she shuts down the conversation because she obviously doesn't want to think about the fact that her fiance might be using her to keep the restaurant going. Which would be really sad if it's true. It is. Now, we're getting into a part of the story, Sam. This next scene literally has nothing to do with anything. I don't know why it's in the story and I'm going to tell you because it's freaking weird. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite kind of scene. I know. 
So that night, as they're camping, they come across a few hunters um, that are down below in kind of little like valley area that have killed a bunch of bald eagles. Ooh. And Kate, Katie's appalled, and Cole is like, she's like, "Those are like our national bird. You can't, you can't kill those. There's not even many of them left in my day and age." And Cole is like, "The eagle becomes our national bird. They're like carrion eaters." Yeah, they're awful. I think Ben Franklin <laughs> wanted the turkey to be our turkey, national yeah. bird. Yeah, yeah. She's like, he's appalled at this. She's appalled that he they killed them and basically they don't kill them to eat them or anything they just sell the feathers so it's kind of a purposeful list uh destruction of these animals and she asks cole if there's any way to stop them from ever hunting again and she knows it's kind of a crazy request and she knows that it's not going to stop everybody from hunting the eagles but if there's just way to like put the fear of god in these three hunters maybe you know that'll stop them from hunting at least and he dresses a ghost and spook them away <laughs> sort of style sort of You're going to like it. All right. So apparently earlier while they were walking through the forest, she had found some wild marijuana plants while they were walking. She's like, oh, my God, there's like a whole little field of them here. And he asks her to hang tight and ends up sneaking down to their camp and kind of in their drunken stupor, he piles their fire with these marijuana plants that he had just learned about from her and dressing himself in the the discarded eagle wings that are there, he so, pretends so to be the spirit of a dead eagle. <laughs> let me get this straight. He literally just learned about the concept of marijuana. From mm-hmm. Katie, Caddy, whoever. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I know exactly how to use this. I will get them high by bringing them in the fire next to them. Because that's how that works. And of course, marijuana hasn't become more potent over the decades or whatever since it's been cultivated. And then I'll dress as a bald eagle by putting on the discarded corpses of these eagles and be like, boo, I'm an eagle. <laughs> you gotta yes. stop hunting me. And somehow... <laughs> <laughs> the marijuana causes hallucinations, even though that's not one of the typical effects of THC. I don't think it's like hallucination so much. It's just like they're pretty stoned and drunk at this point, and so they're like freaked out by this random okay. dude in some eagle outfit. <laughs> I'm still calling nonsense because you know there's a reason there's a whole market of paraphernalia for smoking because oh, it doesn't... absolutely, Sam. I'm not. That's why it's at the. St- there's no point to that. You could have edited this out, and nothing would have changed in the story. <laughs> Great, perfect nonsense. Absolute like, nonsense. Every time I read this part, I'm like, why? <laughs> And she's super thankful to him. They almost make out. It's a whole thing. <laughs> Great. Okay. Next day. Nice day, Sam. Petroglyph day. Do-do-do. Petroglyph day. <laughs> Sounds Cole like a holiday. Is, I know. Cole is sad, but he does his duty and he takes her up to the petroglyphs. And shockingly, the door opens and Katie decides she's definitely going through this time. <laughs> Yeah, don't look back, just run through the door. Make it yes. quick. No, she gives Cole a goodbye kiss and then runs for it, but is suddenly stopped by the man on the white horse. Screw that guy, just go around him. <laughs> and she's like, she has a sudden realization as she's looking at him that this is the man she loves. It's not Cole, it's not Gregory. And she stops long enough to stare at this guy that Cole sweeps in and grabs her off her feet and the portal slams shut and she's not able to make it open again. What is with, like, <laughs> horse man appearing out of nowhere and, like, Cole being like, oh, she's turning another guy. Even though I know she's in love with someone else, I must go snatch her away. <laughs> and he can't see the guy in the horse, obviously, just to be clear. He's just seen her staring at nothing? Or does he yes, see the portal he just, too? No. No, he, he can see the portal, but he does not see the man on the horse, as far as I know. So he sees the portal, and he's like, oh, I gotta stop her from getting home, which is her only wish? Ugh. Yes. <laughs> and she brings that up in this like in the argument. She's like, if you really loved me, you would let me go back through the portal. <laughs> Everyone in this book is terrible. Like she's bit. terrible, that's... they're terrible. They're all off. I don't. I don't like any of them. <laughs> that's, our, that's how we get through books, Sam. <laughs> that's true. That's like our our <laughs> modus operandi. <laughs> no, I don't really read this for the characters. I 100 percent read this for all the food nonsense and the time travel. Totally uh, fair. <laughs> and so she can't get it to open again, and she makes him swear to bring her back tomorrow, and he readily agrees. He's like, "Yes, I will do that. I won't stop you this next time." And uh-huh. she can tell he's totally up to something. No. But when, when she's supposed to do it's not opening just stay there say go ahead i'll just wait here for a day <laughs> so the next morning she awakens in a new house and for reasons that are unclear plot wise she does not seem to remember much of the night before so she's just randomly in a new house and she's like huh well here i am and it's a very fancy new house oh no <laughs> and she is woken up by like the the cook the sh- the ranch manager i don't know his actual job his name's manuel and he lives on the property he and his wife manuel? and i 
Manuel, yep. Yeah. But he tells her that there are some women from town that are here to talk to her about her husband. And before she can even, like, kind of get out of the bed, they all just pile in and start talking to her about this, like, wild story. There's, like, there's five of them or something. All right, let's learn more about how coal is terrible. Okay. So apparently, Legend is not really a mining town, as Cole told her. It's a town that is owned and operated by one person, and that person is Cole Jordan. Yeah. So the, I'm so sorry. Day, was I supposed to be shocked by that? No. The day she'd arrived, uh, the one, remember where she, where he gave the kids some money and they ran off to the ice cream parlor? Mm-hmm. They did not run to the ice cream parlor. They were told to go tell all of the people in town that they couldn't help her. Oh, boy. He's yeah, the worst. <laughs> great then he arranged their wedding literally like that's what he was doing while she was wandering around and the people that tried to kill him earlier the ones that were you know, trying to hang him were actually jealous he wasn't lying about that but it's more that he has 30 million dollars and not just a few head of cattle like he's very very rich and that's why they were jealous of him because he won't sell anything he like owns everything he's he won't like an sell iron anything grip on and this they, town yeah basically and they have to do whatever he wants them to do if they live there but so in return it's a really nice town you know, like, I mean, it's sure, not your a normal dictatorship can be very efficient at making a, a very orderly society, but it's not necessarily healthy or good for other people. Exactly. We'll get into that, Sam. <laughs> Katie is like, okay, well, and he's not there right now. Um, I figured. Cool. So she asks him if they happen to know where the petroglyphs are. And she, Did she not figure like, this out when he took her there last time? I guess, like... I don't know. I guess it's hard to get there, Sam. Oh, she's, like, far I, away. Oh, she's they... in a new town. She's in a new house. Sorry. Duh. She's in a new house. She has no idea where she is. <sighs> she's still in the same town, though, right? Yeah, but she's like on a ranch somewhere far away. Not super far away, but, you know, not in the normal spot. So basically they say Cole is gone and he's supposed to be gone for like days and 10 days is the, is the amount, just for reference. And he's left word that she can't leave the town. In fact, she can't leave the property while he's gone. So she is locked up there. Sounds like a great guy, this Cole. <laughs> You're going to hate how this ends. She <laughs> if they end up together, I will be incensed. <laughs> so she can have anybody up on the property, though. She can like have as many visitors as she wants. She just can't leave. And so she tries to escape multiple times with no success. And she writes, even writes a letter to his grandmother. That's like the only family he has left, begging her to like, come help me escape from your grandson. <laughs> and sends None of this off. is okay. I know. So after a few days, she kind of just accepts that she's stuck there because she like quit her. Yeah, well, like what is she supposed to do? She can't leave. There's armed guards. It's a whole thing. I don't know if they're armed, but they're armed with knives, probably not guns. And after much thought, kind of wondering what she could possibly do when she's alone in this property, she has all the money in the world, but she can't leave. She suddenly reflects on her favorite movie, Babette's Feast. Have you ever seen Babette's Feast? I have not. Okay, well, it's about a woman who decides to, like, put on a giant feast. <laughs> I mean, I, I can kind of guess that from the title. And so she is, like, it's one of her favorite movies because she loves watching this woman, like, figure out all the food and stuff she's going to cook. And she's like, I'm going to do that. I am going to put on a feast, a food extravaganza for this town. This entire, I'm going to invite the entire town. I'm going to spend a crap ton of his money. Like, I'm just going to buy everything and cook everything. Everything I've ever wanted to cook. She wants to write a cookbook. It's one of her, like, life goals. She's like, I'm just going to, like, do cook stuff. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> she should, want. like, make him destitute. Like, if she has control of his finances at this point, ostensibly, because she can buy whatever she wants. Maybe she should just be like, give all his money away, then he'll have no power. Well, that's kind of what she's doing. So <laughs> she basically tells, she's like, I'll cook anything and everything. I'll invite the entire town. I'll hire people at extravagant wages to get supplies and food and it'll serve him right because spread the wealth, you know, eat the rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and then, she... <laughs> like, well, the only reason anyone listens to him is because he has money. So if she gets rid of his money, she can escape no problem. That's true. I don't think she goes that far in her thought process. Or she can just say, hey, guard guy, I'll give you, I don't know, a million dollars to take me to the petroglyphs. <laughs> Like, why, if Cole's out there, why is anybody not, like, raiding his coffers? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, except that he'll be back and he would definitely kill people for <laughs> not listening. Oh, this is the problem. Like, he's one person, though. Yeah. Well, you know how one person can control things for quite a while, Sam. I guess. I'm still not buying it. <laughs> so she goes on to ask the two people who live on site, Manuel and his wife, Dolores, if there are people who can collect mushrooms and help butcher and clean fish. And they're like, oh, yeah, we have, like, some people in our local town that could do that. There's, like... 36 people in this town. And she's like, great, I'm going to hire the whole town. Like $10 an hour, which is absurd amount of money in the 1870s. Like $10 an hour, they're going to come in here, like help me out. And so, and they're like, oh my God. He's like, do you want to help me spend a lot of Cole's money? And they're like, yes, we're on board. Let's do it. <laughs> See, they don't even respect him enough to be like, no, this is his money. Like clearly she could just do it. Why do they even listen to him? <laughs> 
I don't know. They ask her at first. They're like, before they agree to be fair, first they're like, are you planning to hire somebody to kill Cole? Because nobody's going to do that. Like, except maybe Juan. He's some mysterious man that lives in town. Like, he might kill him, but probably not. I don't know. <laughs> but other than that, nobody's going to want to kill Cole for you. And she's like, no, I just want to spend all of his money and cook food. And she's, they're like, oh, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Fine. Also, just like, hey, I want all his money and get out of here. Like, I'll give you, I, I still think bribing her way out would have worked just fine if she has control of his money for whatever reason. I don't reason. know, Sam. Maybe I don't know why they stay. I can't. Sam, it's just part of the book. I don't know the <laughs> thoughts and process of these characters. I'm just saying nonsense. <laughs> So, cutscene. It is the future. Cole is heading back into into town. It is a ghost town. This is ten days later, or whatever, seven days later. And just as he starts to panic that something has gone horribly awry and that Katie's somehow, you know, caught up in this, like some kind of plague or something, he runs into one of the locals in town who's getting the last of the beer to take up to as Katie's place, as they're calling it now, <laughs> which is Cole's house. <laughs> For pasta day. Pasta day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the man, upon realizing who he is, is like, whoa, like he's at first totally doesn't realize it's Coley, so enmeshed in his duty, and then suddenly realizes like, oh, oh crap, you're like the dude, <laughs> like the other in charge. So she te he tells him the story of Katie. So apparently, Katie has hired drivers to go into Denver to get cooking supplies and pays high prices for anything because she firmly believes that he should spread all of his wealth to the neighboring areas. And she's been doing cooking classes for the whole town, so they know, know a ton about food. And Juan, the supposed murderer, is in charge of the whole operation. He's like the general manager up at the house. Sure. <laughs> and the, the whole town is up there. <laughs> and he's she's been paying like a zillion dollars for all this stuff. And she'll cook anything they bring in as long as it's not like on her endangered species list that she gives them. Yeah, so they're, they're endangered in the past, too. Well, she was trying to prevent it in the future in her own small way. Okay. And at first Cole's mad because, you know, I guess I could understand that. <laughs> kind of a jerk anyway. But then decides that the money doesn't even really matter that much to him. The reason why he is so afraid to spend it is because his family had died for it. Um, and so he felt so he felt some kind of requirement to like keep it, you know. But now he sort of sees that it's bringing all these people so much joy and like what he doesn't need it. Like it's just some kind of compulsion so, to keep it. You gotta clear something up for me. Are they the bank robbers? Is that what the family died for? Or do they die retrieving the money? Because you weren't clear whether they actually got the money back or not. They, no, they went after the bank Bank robbers, the bank robbers disappeared, and their the grandpa and the father, whoever it was, died going after yeah, the bank robbers. So how did his family die for the money, his money, if they never recovered it? Meaning that the legend town of people of legend came out and shot people because the money was being robbed and taken away from the town. So his family died because they were trying to like save this money. But if the money was gone, then why does he have it? Well, they have like that's just a bank robbery. They have they own all the property, they own everything. It's not like all the money in the entire city disappeared the entire town it was okay. just this bank robbery it was just a bank robbery all right it wasn't they still own the entire town <laughs> that was not clear they own the entire town at the time like the and it okay. gets into it a little bit later but the jordan family owned the town like that was they already did when he was all little right, all right. yeah that's not i'm not sure that's super clear in the beginning of this novel but it becomes clear shortly so he owns the town now because he inherited all of it but he they owned the town I when he was it. little so Cole makes it back up to the house and is barely let inside. Like, uh, it's so crowded and everybody's like, there's a bunch of rules that he is trespassing on. But they kind of realize, oh, you're the guy who owns the place. Like, I probably should let you in. <laughs> and he finds Katie in the kitchen. And slowly everything kind of stops around them as the town watches to see what he's going to do. So Katie finally sees him and she asks him very sweetly if he'd like to join them because they're having a bite to eat, <laughs> which the entire town is on his property. <laughs> And he's kind of dumb and he's tricked by her tone and convinced that like now that she's seen everything the town has to offer and him. Does he not understand sarcasm? <laughs> no, <laughs> he really doesn't. Because we'll get into this a little bit why, but he's like a little naive, even though he's sort of a player. And basically that she, because she's had this experience and she seems so nice to him right now, she, he's like, well, maybe she wants to stay, you know, <laughs> maybe I we're over the, the worst, worst of it. <laughs> he's just kind of dumb. So she tells him that she has a table set up just for him. She's been waiting for him. And the some of the people that are helping out in the kitchen lead him over to it. And it's a little table under a tree. And it's all by itself. And she presents him with a silver platter that has one of the little lids on top, you know? Yeah, cloche. Right. So he, the, yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So he takes the lid off the dish. 
And on the plate are roasted potatoes, carrots, slices of buttered bread, and a big black rat rolled in breadcrumbs and deep fried. Good. Make him eat the rat. <laughs> and everybody laughs and laughs and thinks it's like the funniest thing ever because they've, you know, been under his thumb this entire time. And it's funny to see your boss get screwed over a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I've been waiting years for this. And in that moment, he has kind of like a little mental break. And he suddenly realizes basically that he's trying to force a woman to love him, right? That she doesn't want his youth wife and she doesn't want to be up here. And why was he trying so hard to keep her here? Because he's a terrible person who is spoiled. Yes, he is definitely spoiled. He socks into the kitchen and he picks her up and carts her out of the house. And she's like, it is just a joke. What is wrong with you? Like, you don't have to eat the rat. <laughs> And she puts he puts her on a horse, and they start heading down the mountain, and she realizes that they're heading towards the petroglyphs. Finally. Yes. So she immediately starts an internal war with herself. She's like, should I stay? Should I go? Stay? Like, Why would you stay with the man who literally <laughs> imprisoned you? <laughs> yeah, she knows she belongs to another time, but that is no, also- No, not another time. Like, don't have to stay with Cole, the man who manipulated this whole town into making you destitute so you'd have to rely on him so he could try to get into your pant and then imprisoned you when he realized you actually could escape him. Yes. Okay. Yes. That is all a good point, Sam. But her argument is not so much about Cole in her head right now that we're in. <laughs> it should that... be. What else is relevant? <laughs> so she's talking about, yes, she belongs in this other time. And yes, obviously she's in this weird situation. But this was the first time, like the time that he's been gone, this is the first time she's like made real friends and she's doing something that she loves to do and she's been teaching people which is something she's always wanted to do is like do cooking classes for people who really need it and don't you know understand cooking and this is the first time she felt she belonged somewhere so it's not about Cole it's about like all the relationships she's made with these people in town and a little bit about Cole but mostly about all the relationships she's made in town it's very stupid is all I'm saying like well I am literally... to be fair I'm summarizing oh let's this is like 200 pages of books <laughs> I don't I mean I don't care how much but there's very little that she could think that would justify a literal kidnapping and imprisonment. Okay, I do not disagree. I'm like not necessarily Team Cole or anything. I'm just saying that like he's part like part of the reason she stays because she like kind of likes him. Though she doesn't like anything he's doing, but she mostly likes all the people in town and the stuff she's gotten to do there and how she feels like she belongs in this community. Awful. And she's Awful. never felt like that in Virginia. <laughs> I mean, yay! But also. Uh, literally having no agency and being at the mercy of this clearly unstable liar is not a good situation. <laughs> Again, he's like, he's definitely doing terrible. Th I'm not arguing that, that Cole is a good person. He's definitely doing terrible things, but he also is like, he's okay in the book. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sorry. To, I know this is how people get trapped in abusive relationships. Like, well, he's sweet sometimes. And when he's not abusing me, he's really wonderful. Like, no. I agree that everything he's doing doing is terrible. I'm not You need to get out. That. You can't let the good justify the awful. Do not disagree. However, it will be irrelevant shortly. <laughs> well, hopefully he gets shot. <laughs> yes, that's what happens. Not to spoil too much. So they reach the petroglyph and the portal opens. And though she's hesitant about going back, Cole basically... <laughs> Sam, just accept the fact that she is torn about this decision, okay? She deserves to be stuck in the past. <laughs> So Cole pushes her through and she watches him from the other side and it's like growing smaller and smaller. The portal is like on her wall in her apartment, but on the rock in, in Colorado. And she's kind of hoping that like something is going to trigger her to, to make her like make this decision easier. Like the Arabian man will show up again or something, but nothing happens. And then she's like having flashbacks to all her time in legend. And she suddenly sees bloods like stained across Cole's shirt. Like it's spreading and she realizes that he's injured. And then makes, you're going to love this, makes why the incredible, is why is he injured? She makes the incredible jump in logic that it's Cole's shirt that's bloody. Yes. Was that clear to you? Yeah, yeah. She, she, he's okay. bleeding. He said he's bleeding. He got injured yes. somehow. Yes. So she, uh, he then, she then makes the incredible jump in logic that the reason why he was gone for the 10 days was because he had to do something important. And that thing was like dangerous to do and it was somehow could have imperiled her and so that's why she was locked in the house for the 10 days is because she was he was afraid that's either like somebody would come after her related to the situation that made him leave for the 10 no, days but no. i'm just saying that is the jump in logic she makes in this moment which is incredible <laughs> even if that were true 
justifying, hey, I'm imprisoning you for your own good is not a justification for imprisonment. Like, she would have been safer through the portal than trapped in his house. Like, she, he definitely would have. And also, he could have just told her, like, I've got to go do something. Like, could you please stay on the property for 10 days? Like, you don't have to, like, I bet she would have. <laughs> Well, she is that, like, pliable, apparently, and, and stupid <laughs> enough to be like, oh, this man who has lied to me constantly, I can totally trust him to have my best interests at heart. <laughs> anyway, this is a thought she has, this incredible jump in logic where she suddenly realizes his true intentions on keeping her on the property wasn't really that he was locking her up, locking her up. It was his just because- don't <laughs> matter. <laughs> I'm not going to argue that, Sam. I do not disagree. I don't think it's a valid reason to keep her locked up. I agree 100% with you. That's not the point. This is her thought process. This is the time. She is awful. <laughs> <laughs> She's worse than Cole because I, I not to you know victim blame or anything, but like she has power here and she's refusing to use it. <laughs> Well, you're going to love it because she jumps through the portal and goes back to Cole in this moment. <laughs> I hate her. I absolutely hate her. <laughs> I knew you'd love this. <laughs> I feel bad for her that she's trapped in this abusive cycle. Well, we'll see what happens. So I know Cole's I will, like, and I'm sad about it. <laughs> it's almost over. Cole is shocked, asking if she's sure. Like, he's just convinced she was going to head back that moment. And she's like, I'm not sure, but I do want to stay a bit longer and kind of, like, work this out and, you know, figure figure it out. I, I don't love Love you, but I like you, I guess. <laughs> and I really like the town. <laughs> Dumb. I know. So cue some time passing. It's it's just a few paragraphs, but obviously some time has passed. And the only thing of importance that happens during this is obviously they get closer together. They kind of establish more of a relationship. They talk about this mine that is supposedly lost, at least in the 1800s, called the Lost Maiden Mine. And... By 1996, it's been found in modern day. And so she knows where it is. Yeah, so Cole wants to go in search of the money since he's, like, apparently... So how people... does she know? Did she, like, take a tour of Colorado and learn no, about the No, apparently it's, mine? like, it was a huge deal in the 70s or whatever when it was found. Like, it's, okay. it was one of those news stories that, like, just kind of swept up up the nation. You know, everybody was paying attention to it. And it ha I think it happened in the 70s, and the people who found it, like, ended up having to get a bunch of lawyers because there was all this, like, argument over who, you know, got right, what money or whatever. And they, like, basically spent all the money on lawyers and so cole's like well we could spend the money better than that like why let them have it they're not even gonna like use it and he says he wants to go in search of it to find it and if he found it he would bury it under the moss and she could look for it in modern day and she would be rich or <laughs> or two other ideas that are better than that a take it with you through the portal because <laughs> duh don't have to wait for it to be buried in a freaking mosque or any other building for that matter or b spread the wealth to all those town people who you keep in servitude with your money well apparently he's been spreading the wealth i'm sure since then so i mean these people now have a zillion dollars she gave ten dollars an hour back then for seven days of work they're gonna live for years off that money so they're interrupted weeks, I think it's weeks, a week, a couple days later, I don't know, time has no meaning. They're interrupted several times later in their little love nest by the arrival of Ruth Jordan. This is Cole's grandma. And, and she got the letter asking for help. She did quite a while ago. And she'd like to meet Katie out by the hanging tree, which is where she originally kind of came through that portal. That's what they call it, the hanging tree? What the a great tree. name. <laughs> Make it up, Sam. That's what it's called. <laughs> So she remember she's like, oh, yeah, I sent a message like that first day that I was trapped here. I guess I should probably go meet your grandma and like that we should go meet your grandma. And Cole basically kind of like talk, tries to talk her out of leaving like, you don't want to leave the house, stay here forever. <laughs> like He's awful. Yeah. You know, the grandma won't come into legend because she hates it due to the history there. You know, her whole family dying. Yep. And she's trying to convince him to go with her. But it's kind of weird to meet his grandma alone for the first time. But he's basically like, no, she'll want to meet you alone because she'll want to, you know, get all the details from you and give you all the little you know, stories about my childhood, embarrassing stories. And she's going to have one of those little like tea parties with the tiny little glasses and sandwiches. You can put like five in your mouth at the same time. Like you go, you have good bonding time with her and then try and convince her to bring her back here for dinner okay so he sends her off they do like an impassioned guess or whatever and he asks her not to forget him and she's like mm, yeah you're not really a man a woman forgets about and heads out she doesn't love him but she's kind of like half in love with him she is terrible taste in men <laughs> no argument so she hits it off with the grandma immediately she meets her under the tree she does indeed have one of those little like tea party 
cups, you know, with little Let tiny cups. Let me ask cups. you something really quick here. Uh huh. Is the book trying to set up Cole to be a complete tool, or is he supposed to be a romantic, in- an actual like valid romantic interest? I think he. Um, you might have more of an opinion here in the next couple of paragraphs, but he <laughs> <laughs> he definitely. Is meant to be semi charming, and I like I don't disagree with most of the things that he does. But in the story itself, he has a certain naivete and like dorkiness that kind of is charming in the book. Like you don't find him as offensive as his actions are. If that makes sense. Many monsters are very charming. Danielle, I am not arguing any of that. I'm just saying. My I question think, is merely. I think he's supposed to be sort of a romantic interest, but <sighs> the okay. way the story goes, which we'll find out here shortly, is kind of weird, and so. Eh. Arguable. <laughs> all right, but she does all right. kind of like him. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out if the book is setting him up to be terrible or not. No, it's setting him up, to definitely setting him up to be a romantic interest, which it does something interesting in just a little bit. But it sets him up to be like, you're supposed to like him at least enough and like assume that she's going to have some future with him and you might grow to like him more. Because he's clearly okay. having, I didn't get into all the, the conversations and stuff they have, but like he's clearly having an, more of an arc and he's definitely not being so like weird and obsessed. Like, it's just, he didn't know how, like, he's just stupid. <laughs> okay. I'm not saying that validates anything he's doing. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Let's get into the tea party now. Okay. So they're having a tea party. Does indeed have the tidy little cups and tidy little sandwiches, which delights Katie because she starts to laugh and is thinking about Cole's story about, like, breaking them when he was a kid and eating all the cakes and sandwiches. And this seems to kind of perturb the grandma a little bit. And the grandma's like, tell me everything, like, about about my grandson, how you met him. I haven't seen him in so many years. Like, just everything. She's like, also, kind of laughs. I'm sorry, another question. Now that they're talking, uh-huh. isn't Katie's vernacular wildly different yeah, than, I'd like, the so. time They kind of mention that a couple of times in the story, but it don't go too much in depth with it. But yes, I would imagine that her, though she has been there for a few weeks now, so maybe she's kind of, you know, sounds a little bit more natural. But yes, I'd imagine what she's speaking is much different than what this woman's speaking. All right, all right, sorry, go on. I just remembered that being something that might... It'd be weird. Yeah, and I mean, he does... maybe he was arguing about her, like, you're not from the future, that you just sound weird. Yeah, but... internal dialogue. When you get the chapter in Cole's viewpoint, he's like, he does mention that she speaks weirdly. Okay, all right, all right, sorry, I, I keep interrupting with No, it's totally fine. Right. That's the whole point, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> So Katie kind of laughs at her request and is like, you would not believe me if I told you my story. And the grandma's like, no, I'd like, tell me your story because I have a feeling I, I will believe this more than you think I will. And Katie kind of feels herself being drawn to tell her actual story about her time travel. So she launches into it. Did she time it. travel too? Grandma no, we'll time travel? <laughs> no, that's not what happened. But good good guess, Sam. All right. By the time our story winds down, it's you know a couple hours later, and the grandma surprisingly tells her that she does believe her story. And Katie kind of smiles like, oh, yeah, I'm sure you do. She says, I don't see how you could. Time travel is not really something that happens. And the grandma's like, no, it's not really a time travel part that's hard to believe. The hard part is that you met my grandson at all. And she's like, yeah, it's weird that I would travel through time just specifically to meet this person if that's the reason I time travel. And then the grandma calls for her aide who's like, you know, sitting over by the carriage or whatever. She's like, hey, bring us some brandy. And Katie's like, nah, I'm good. (laughs) Like, I don't need anything. It's the middle of the day. Right. (laughs) And the grandma's like, no, you're going to need some brandy. Like, sit, sit down, drink your brandy. <laughs> and Katie's getting a little anxious. She's like, what? You know what's going on? Why do you, why do you think I need alcohol? And Grandma tells her that it's 1897, which of course it is, and that her grandson, Cole, died 24 years ago in the bank robbery. So who's this dude? <laughs> so Katie thinks she's crazy. She's like, uh, no, because I was just with your son, your grandson, like, you know, to spend several weeks with him. He's in town. Let's, like, we could go visit him if you want to. Is this like a pocket dimension outside of time? We'll find out, Sam. And <laughs> so Ruth, the grandma, is like, okay, then let's go visit my grandson then. Like, I, that's clearly the only way to convince you. So the next scene is Katie in town. And the entire town of legend is in ruins. The mines are collapsed. There are dozens of crumbling saloons and brothels. Everything's smaller and darker and just dirtier. Um, nothing's as pretty as it was when she was there before. And Ruth goes on to explain that Cole's father found silver in the town and was intent on keeping the town pretty and like a place to raise families, not like the quote unquote cesspit of brothels and saloons like most silver mining towns got to be. Okay. So he wanted to keep it like a family-run place where people could raise yeah, their kids. Yeah, a Chuck E. Cheese of the Old West. I got yes. it. 
Yeah, idealists is what they call, are called in this story. So they bought up the town, refusing to sell it in the hopes of keeping it, you know, a safe place for families. And they did get very possessive of their money. So it's not like all well and good. She explains that all the things from Katie's version of legend definitely existed just in other forms. Like Juan, the murderer, was just a young boy Cole's age that had a disagreement with him. The girls who had come to tell her about how Cole had wronged her were the local saloon girls that Cole, Cole had had a crush on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So like everything has a basis in reality, but was not how it actually was presented when she was with Cole. And she tells her that Cole lingered for three days after everyone else had died and... After her grief of losing everyone in her family, she and the father of Cole's best friend, Tarek, um, had had sex and she became pregnant with a child. This is Ruth. But so, uh, Ruth found new love in tragedy. Perfectly right. reasonable. Except that Tarek's father had uh, had a wound that was inflicted on him during the gunfight and he also ended up passing away. All right. Well, I mean, at least he had a little fun before he went. <laughs> yes. So they, you know, had a moment and she admits that when she found out she was pregnant, keeping the baby safe was like the only thing on her mind because she'd had so much tragedy in her life. Everybody was dead. Like she was like, I'm not raising my child in legend, Colorado. And she ended up moving to Denver and she turned her property basically into a fortress. She shut down the entire town of legend in her anger at the people that lived in it. And eventually her 16 year old son ran away telling her that her hatred of legend was stronger than her love of him. Great. Cool. So far, perfect sense. Nothing in this story doesn't make sense. <laughs> So Ruth tells her that she isn't sure why Katie is the one that came back, but it gave her grandson a chance at an adult life and a chance at revenge. And Katie's like, excuse me? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so it turns out that the bank robbers had never been caught when they left, as I mentioned. But yeah, just I got that. But just recently, Ruth had received word that one of the men suspected of it was found dead in his study with a knife in his heart. And there was a signed confession of his participation in the holdup and a will donating all of the money to local orphanages. So when Cole went off on his little escapade, it was to murder this guy. Absolutely, because the knife that was found had a medal on it that was placed next to it. And it was the same medal that Cole had been buried with that came up earlier in the story. I didn't mention it, but it's just a one year's attendance for Sunday school medal. And it was found with the knife that was stabbed through this guy's heart. Okay. So she knows. So like she just Cole revenge. Yeah. And so Ruth event or initially had gotten this letter and thought, oh, it's just a prank. You know, like how people do that for Anastasia kind of thing. You know, like just like, mm -hmm. trying to get money out of rich people. So she ignored the letter. But when this, she found out that this guy had died with the medal on it that Cole had been buried with, she wondered. And the way that Katie had talked about Cole in her story, which is like very realistic to how Cole was as a kid, she wondered if maybe something weird was going on. And that's why she came in town to meet Katie. She's taking her ghost grandson very well. <laughs> I know. She's very like accepting of this fact <laughs> that her ghost grandson became an adult, not even like stayed as a ghost nine-year-old, but actually became an adult. Yeah. <laughs> Lived a life. <laughs> so Katie's a little shell-shocked, understandably, but her... If I guess her final hurrah before whether she's going home, obviously she doesn't know what else she's supposed to do because legend no longer exists. Which it is, didn't I'm exist sure. ever. I don't know I what know, she was doing. I know, but she didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, but the, where was she, Danielle? It's, damn, it's ghost shenanigans. Jeez. <laughs> How is that the hardest part to believe in this, like, any story? I'm just saying, like, this is all so hand-wavy. Like, well, <laughs> anything could be true at this point, so what is reality? Okay, says the man who just shared four episodes of a story yeah, where yeah. things just happened. <laughs> and I was very critical about that. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not as critical, but yes, it is very hand-wavy. <laughs> So she ends up telling Ruth, Ruth asks her kind of like about the wedding dress that she had found and she describes it to, to her as, and Katie had assumed it was, it was Cole's mom's dress. Cause that kind of made sense, you know, given the context. And Ruth is like, the style of it isn't right for that era. And they weren't, you guys weren't the same size. And she assumes that she herself, meaning, meaning Ruth must have put the dress in the tin that started the whole thing. So she was going to go ahead and do that. Okay. <laughs> I love when time feels like it needs to explain how things worked out. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So she's like, I put the dress in the tin that doesn't, well, where'd she get there? So so now she has to go and get the dress and find the exact same dress and put in the tin so this whole thing can start. I think no matter what dress she picks, it'll probably be the dress that Katie found because it's just how time works. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
fate, Sam. It's fate. It's something. So she thanks Katie for giving Cole a chance at life and asks her to do one more thing. She's like, if you can, and you don't have to, but if you can, I would like you to meet my descendants in the modern day. Like, we obviously didn't end well for my descendants. I haven't talked to my son in years, but like, I want to, I just kind of want to know that they're doing okay, you know? I mean, you assumed you even have descendants. Yeah, she says, if I do have descendants. She does mention that. Okay. So she wants Katie to meet them if they exist. She's going to give her six weeks from the day she met Cole, which I'm assuming means that she assumes that time is stood still. <laughs> I uh, sure. How I'm gonna give her six weeks. Like you're gonna send her back through time and give her six weeks to do what? Like what you gonna do? Come through time after her? No, I think she's gonna give Mike. Okay, I read this a few times because I also had this thought. But I think the concept is like, uh, what's the date that you came over? And I'll give you six weeks from from then. And if nothing's changed in my life here in the 1800s, that I will assume that you didn't meet my descendants or nothing happened there. Or nothing changed. Why would her meeting her descendants in the future retroactively change the past? I think she just thinks that. The there's somehow like Katie, because she's had this ability to already go in the past and change so much, not change things, but, you know, give her grandson a chance at life, blah, 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 whatever, that she thinks somehow she's connected to her future, that like just by meeting her descendants, it might somehow make their past less tragic. Like it might resolve something from Yeah, that doesn't make any sense, but it sure. It doesn't, but that's like the concept of the story, Sam. And I well, think it's, it's all a, very it's a nonsense like, I, concept. Right. And the grandma, I think is very much like, I could be wrong. I just think it might change something. So like, I'll give you six weeks and obviously if not things changed here like if i i don't know anything's changed but i'm thinking how would you know things have changed what if they just changed <laughs> yeah also like why six weeks why like just let her go like if the six weeks passes and things haven't changed what are you gonna do is that gonna change anything about your life you're gonna change any, do anything differently like it, it, it's arbitrary and stupid it is but that's what she says sam and it's really just to give her a deadline when she's potentially back in her real world trying to figure stuff out i'm sure i get it. it's just a ticking clock but it is it's 100 percent just a ticking clock so that's what she tells her six weeks and they take her up to the petroglyphs and to no one's surprise the portal opens and this time katie steps through back into her apartment and and it shuts behind her. Finally. Dun, finally. Dun, dun. Should have done that from day one, and this whole book would have been avoided. <laughs> this is a lot of setup for the second half of this book, Sam. <laughs> I am so annoyed by all these. I don't care if Cole's a ghost. He's still a terrible person. I don't disagree. <laughs> but I love that one of my favorite things about this book is that there's 200 pages of setup and then 200 pages of the actual plot. I... Uh. So all that was basically irrelevant, could have been summarized in a paragraph? No, it's relevant, sort of, but it's just, it's convoluted. Sam, I'm telling you the story is weird and convoluted and time sassy and I just, A time travel romance story is weird and convoluted. (laughs) Tell me about it. And it gets weirder, progressively weirder, because the second half of this book is so strange. (laughs) Great. Well, I mean, I hope the characters are at least less hateable. I don't recall. It's been a couple of years since I read the second half of this book. Well, I'm excited to find out, Danielle. <laughs> There's definitely several characters that get absolutely no development and they're wild. And you're like, who are these people? <laughs> Great. So I'm looking forward to that. So I guess I have no nothing really left to add. I, a lot of this is going to depend on how it ends. Yes. I'm not sure you're going to love the ending, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, regardless of whether or not I love it, we're going to have it, and that should be fun either way, I assume. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed my time-traveling wedding dress story, Sam. Um, that's far. a strong word for it, <laughs> but I certainly had some fun. <laughs> it's a wild story. You can't say you saw any of that coming. Nope, most of that I did not see coming, you're right. But on the other hand, most of that I don't see a need for. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know how it plays into the second half. Maybe it does, Sam. Maybe it does. All right. Well, I'm excited to be proven wrong, Danielle. Or maybe it doesn't. And maybe that's why this book is so weird is because like many things in many of our stories, we just disregard everything they built up. That is one of our favorite weird tropes. I do remember the first time I read this, I was like, wait, she's back in her modern world. What's going on? (laughs) (laughs) Where's Cole? What's happening? Cole sucks. Be glad he's gone. (laughs) Like, what's the Arabian prince have to do with anything? (laughs) So that is confused. a valid question. I don't know what that's all about, and I'm not sure I'm going to like how that all plays out. <laughs> you may or may not. We'll find out. Next week on Book Retorts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, if you want to suggest uh, what you think a reasonable flower tin size should be <laughs> and whether or not it would hold a wedding dress, you can send your 3D renderings of flower tins to us at bookretorts.com. Okay, I'm going to argue that if we just Google the flower tin, it would indeed show no, us what old-timey flower tins look like. I want to see the 3D renderings our, our like. listeners make, Daniel. I don't want to Google anything. Let's let's get some authentic... I, I want someone out there to make a render of a flower tin to be big enough to hold all that nonsense. I always just assumed it was trunk-sized, because otherwise but it wouldn't have a the trunk size flower tin. That's insane. I assume it was flour and bulk, Sam. I mean, why would you why buy would a tiny little home? bag of flour? Because you're having a bulk. Because you cooked. You lived in the middle of nowhere, and going to the store was not as easy as driving down two miles sure, to the sure, grocery sure. store. I get that, but why would you be like, yeah, I want that giant ass flour tin? Because you made a lot of bread and hardtack and stuff back no, in the day I'd with say, flour. I get that, but not in the modern world when she bought the dang thing from the antique person. Well, I don't know why she wants it in her house. She just thought it would be cool, and she's a chef, so she was like, oh, cool, flour tin. <laughs> I think it's just a decorative. Why do pipe people buy anything for decoration in their house, Sam? <laughs> I'm just saying, flower tin nonsense. You'd have a better way to store it, maybe, than a flower tin. What has always actually perplexed me, and this is not going to help my argument or yours at all, is that in the book she's mentioned something about putting it on top of her shelving in her kitchen. Yeah, okay. As like a decoration. And I'm like, well, how big is it? <laughs> So yeah, why don't you all render that out for us? Send us at bookretorts.com. Or tweet Instagram or Facebook us at bookretorts. And if you want more nonsense or just want to support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash bookretorts. Patreon. I'm curious what we're going to do for Patreons on this one. Maybe something oh, to do boy, time Daniel. travel. I can't wait <laughs> to hear guesses. what your ideas are. These are all on you. <laughs> oh, it's not fair. I come up with some of your stuff. <laughs> I come up with more of yours, though. That's true. I'm not very good at ideas. I'm not the idea person behind this. It's okay. We all we all have our strengths. <laughs> well, until next time, we figure out what happens to Katie and the ghosts, which sounds like a, a Josie and the Pussycats knockoff. I would watch that. Yeah, me too. Until then. There is Bye. actually a TV show. Oh, sorry. That was bad timing. <laughs> all right. Go on. Let's hear it. There's this. like this Disney Channel or something TV show that has about a girl who meets a ghost band. It, like, rocks out with them. Great. Uh, well, I'm not surprised. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically the same plot as this book, is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. A lot more musical. <laughs> you don't know that it's not musical in this part. Maybe we'll uh, we will, we'll do that for our next book retorts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway. Until then. Bye. <laughs> Take care, everybody. <laughs> This is like a book laser targeted at you, Danielle. <laughs> With what? Like time it's traveling? Got food, <laughs> it's got dumb time travel. It's got ridiculous romance and love triangles that don't really make a lot of sense and uh, a bunch of other nonsense. It's perfect this, for you. It is actually the reason why I watched Babette's Feast because I heard it mentioned in this book. And there's actually the reason why I know a couple of food dishes because of this book. So it, it did stick in my head quite a lot. Clearly. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs>